Welcome, everybody. I've got the welcome to the Community Service Committee for the 10th of May. And I've got uh, Sam to do Kaukau, please. Right, well, kia ora koutou, Sam for the Kaukau. Whakataka tahou, ki te uru. Whakataka tahou, ki te tonga. Kia mā, kina, kina, ki uta. Kia mā, tara, tara, ki tai. E hi, a ki a nā te atu kura. He tio, he huka, he ahohu, ti hei, mau, ni ora. Good one. Okay, there's no apologies. So, any identification of extraordinary business? None. Conflicts of interest? No. Um, Chip, persons report, which has been distributed, which you have all have read. Are there any questions on my report? If, if not, oh, sorry. Um, yes. Um, well, public forum, there is none. Thank you. And now the children's report. I'd like to move. Do I have a seconder? All those in favour, welcome. Thanks. All those in favour, thanks. Carried. Okay, manager's report. And the primary focus of the report is just a, a summary of the quarterly report that you have, uh, which is a far more comprehensive report on the activities of the community services and facilities group um, as part of the agenda today. Um, apart from that, um, there's, uh, as an appendix to the report, as uh, requested by the chair at the last meeting, um, just a structure of the um, senior management within the community services and facilities group so people are aware of um, of the roles and responsibilities that sit there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move for the minutes of the last meeting. Okay, welcome. And Deborah, all those in favour? Aye. And it's carried, thank you. Um, the destination management can you? So, uh, um, welcome our guests from uh, Christchurch NZ. Um, just as they come up to the front to provide a presentation on where things have got to with the destination management plan, councillors will recall that in September 2022, Ali and um, other um, other members of the team came out and talked to council about the process they were embarking upon with a destination management plan, and um, and so this is an opportunity for uh, Ali and her team to give feedback to council um, through this committee on progress to date and get any final feedback on the draft with an expectation that it will go to the full council meeting on the 14th of June as the final. So welcome, Ali and team. Thanks very much. Thank you. Is that right? Have I got that one yet? Yeah. So thank you so much for having us. And firstly, apologies, I'm not 100% um, today, so I'm not going to do a lot of the talking. I'm also not the subject matter expert, so it's much better that you're going to hear from Julia and Lauren. Uh, but thank you so much for having us. It is a real pleasure to be here. Feels like a long time since um, since we were last here. Um, so good to good to see you again, and we're very much looking forward to sharing the progress of this work with you. Um, so um, can you flip to the first slide for me, please, Lauren? I'm just literally just going to share um, one slide, which just tells you a little bit about what we're going to cover today and a little bit about why um, this piece of work has been done. So today we're going to talk about the context of the DMP. What is a DMP? Just a reminder of what a destination management plan is and why we are doing this work. Then an overview of the process, and then Lauren is going to take you through some of the key findings or recommendations that come from the report so that we can start to get your views on how they um, might be actioned and implemented for the Selwyn region. Um, then we're going to have time to talk about next steps and the decisions, and you've already outlined those, so thank you very much, um, before we move on to questions. So we'll leave plenty of time for questions. Um, so just to remind you about where this piece of work has come from, it's a mixture of uh, us being asked to do it and actually it just being the right time to do it from an opportunity perspective. So um, MB, as you know, have been funding destination management plans around the country. There are 30. Uh, we are responsible for two. We um, uh, will talk a little bit about the regions that the two we're looking at cover. 
Um, uh, so MB have funded the majority of this work. We have also been asked to do it through the Greater Christchurch 2050 plan and from our letter of expectation from the Christchurch City Council, who, as you know, is our main shareholder. Um, but really, the opportunity is why this is the right time to be doing it. It is really um, a perfect time for us to be rethinking about our region and how we present ourselves to overseas and domestic visitors alike. Um, so that we can make sure that we are consistently telling the great story of what the Canterbury um, uh, region has to offer and making sure that we maximise our share of voice um, by speaking with one particular um, uh, direction. So look, I'm, that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Julia, who's going to briefly just take you through a little bit more context about our, our DMP work. Thanks, Sally. Um, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge um, we worked very closely with Denise Inclair and Shay on this um, throughout this process. Um, we've had a huge amount of support from your team, and I, th I think that um, I, I hope they agree that we, we, we've got a really good partnership in place as we work through the destination management plan for this wider area. So we're doing two destination management plans. One is for the Banks Peninsula in particular, and that is because there are significant environmental and cruise-related issues for that particular community, quite distinct from the issues faced by the wider area. And the wider area is for the second uh, destination management plan is for the balance of the Christchurch City Council boundary plus Selwyn, Waimakariri and Ashburton areas. So the key point here is that visitors don't see those boundaries in the same way that we might, um, and visitors and residents don't see them as they move across and around our area. So it makes sense to take a wider view to the destination as the broader area. Um, the DMPs themselves, uh, MB have funded us, but they've also put in place some quite clear guidance on what a destination management plan needs to entail. There are 16 components. I'm not going to go through them one by one, but you'll see that it covers a really broad range of touch points that we need to consider as we develop the destination management plan. Um, what is destination management? It's important just to um, maybe just be really clear about the difference between destination management and what we used to have, which was really a volume-based destination marketing play. So, um, you know, tourism, tourism traditionally has been a numbers game. It's been about driving increased visitor volume. But we've seen uh, nationally and globally that there are consequences for that sort of approach. And in some places, the environment and the resident experience has been impacted by a volume play. So there's a growing sort of international move towards a more proactive management approach to a destination. And that is um, what we're stepping into in this process. In terms of what we've done so far, we, um, as I said, worked really closely with your team as we worked through what we called a discovery and situational analysis phase, is building the evidence base. And we did a lot of community consultation, we did a community survey, 4,400 odd survey responses for the wider area, which is a very good survey response. We had a visitor survey, so that's uh, surveying visitors that were had previously been to the wider area or were planning to visit and we got nearly 10,000 responses to that survey so that is a really uh, deep and rich evidence base. We also did a lot of stakeholder consultation, lots of one-on-one -on -one interviews, we did workshops and we did a destination benchmarking exercise where we benchmarked this area against 13 other cities or destinations globally to identify our points of difference. So when we looked at that evidence base, we were able to draw out solemn specific findings. And um, I'm just going to touch on a few of those findings um, as we move through. Um, these are some data points, but not the entire evidence base, but they're just interesting data points that we thought that were useful for this conversation. So when we asked your residents, your resident base, about the importance of tourism to the economy of this area, uh, you'll see there that um, very important, some have got important, rated very highly. You know, so 50 odd percent of your community think that tourism is very or somewhat important to your economy. This is a word cloud that when we ask your residents the first things that come to mind when they think of this area. 
Um, you'll see there, I'm sure none of this is a huge surprise to you, um, you know, friendly, community, growing, quiet, rural, uh, all, um, you know, uh, uh, popular responses. And then when we looked at um, the impressions that people have of Salem as a place to live, rated very highly, to work and to visit, rated very highly. And factors that uh, residents considered really important um, were road connectivity, probably no surprise to you, nature and parks, outdoor activities and family-friendly activities. Now, interestingly, those three, the bottom three, are the, the same for Christchurch residents. Life in Selwyn, again, just some interesting data points. Selwyn-based um, respondents rated good or excellent, the quality of life, a good place to raise a family, being safe to live in, etc. And again, nature and parks, outdoor activities and family-friendly activities rated really highly. We then um, took that evidence base and with uh, support from Claire and Shay, did a workshop with some stakeholders from Selwyn that they identified for us. And we workshopped that evidence base with that group. And I'm not going to walk through all of these findings because they actually translate into the actions within the DMP that relate to Selwyn. But um, the, you know, the, key, the key sort of high level things were around that open outdoor recreational opportunity, telling a, a deeper and richer mana whenua story, um, barriers around connectivity and transport um, in some opportunities um, that were identified through that process. So I'm going to hand over to Lauren and she's going to walk you through what that actually means in terms of the destination management plan. Thank you. Kia ora, Tina Koto, uh, Tina Koto, Kolaun uh, Toko uh, My name is Lauren Hesse. I'm general manager of destination and attraction at Christchurch NZ. I um, mean, I've recently returned from maternity leave, so this has been a really interesting project for me to jump into with fresh eyes. Um, and has had some benefits in many ways because I've uh, not been involved with some of the uh, thought processes. I've have had it presented fresh to myself as well. So. Um, look, where we've landed, um, and again, to reiterate Julia's comments, it's been really great working with the management team around uh, how this is shaping up, because we feel really confident that some of the thematic journeys that we've gone on are really appropriate, uh, but today we're hoping to present some of these to you and then workshop them. So the primary focus of the destination management plan where we've landed is quite unusual for a DMP in New Zealand, uh, in that it is still to drive managed growth of visitation. So most destination management plans uh, across the country are very focused on capping visitor numbers. However, the investment in infrastructure for the visitor economy, particularly in Christchurch, is not yet at capacity and there is significant volume that can still be grown in the city and the destination. And that uh, provides a lot of support to our neighbouring districts because it means that we can provide what we call hot and spoke itineraries where people stay in Christchurch, they do day trips out, or they tour around the districts and still touch into Christchurch. The secondary part of increasing visitation in Christchurch is that it becomes a really good countersink to over-tourism in Queenstown and Auckland and provides a really strong second international gateway to provide sustainability with the visitor economy across the national system. So we feel that um, by driving growth, that is of benefit not only to the city, but to uh, our neighbouring regions. However, that also needs to be managed. So the secondary part of the destination management plan is that we're looking to move to a regenerative focus. So we'll talk you through what it looks like as we move into the detail, but that is to ensure that we're still driving value and dispersal across the districts so that we're making a really clear ecosystem of visitation across the four parties to the DMP. So the destination management plan sets out a significant amount of context to Selwyn and, and the unique selling points and characteristics of, of the district. In particular, it highlights and acknowledges the role of the Tūrunanga um, and how the Tūrunanga can influence storytelling and we can work alongside Mana Whenua to really highlight some of those storytellings. But also many of those things that you are all well aware of, hills, mountains, biking, hiking, jet boating, transalpine, um, and identifying that cell one with its agriculture um, in, in fertile soils is a really rich uh, culinary story. 
So I'm going to quickly talk you through um, seven recommendations today. There are 10 in the destination management plan. Uh, those three are very, very Christchurch specific, uh, but you will see some of those elements within here. So the first, as mentioned, is growing our destination, both our city and districts. So that is um, enhancing the collaboration between the tourism entities of Christchurch NZ and those in Selwyn, Ashburton and Waimakiri, and focusing on attracting three, three core visitors types, family-oriented travellers, sophisticated explorers, and then we're currently reviewing the inclusion of active adventurers. Um, so these are psychographic travel types as opposed to age or wealth factors. Um, we also acknowledge that there is a need to continue to develop iconic tourism attractions across the districts and the city. We are lacking what we would call iconic tourism drivers. There are a couple, for example, Transalpine, uh, but we acknowledge that there is a need for increased investment into attractions through growing the visitor economy. Uh, data is always an issue in tourism, and there is another piece that we have acknowledged that we need to work on for growing our destination. We did talk about activating our region as a whole, so that is about defining our collective strategic priorities and then developing themed journeys. So to the point where visitors don't see borders, as an example, they may stay in Christchurch and scan at Mount Hart and have no idea that they've crossed multiple territorial authorities in that day trip. So working collectively to highlight some of those itineraries that cross borders. Uh, and also looking at how we combine our resources. So one of the things you'll see out of this destination management plan is there is not a specific ask. There is no financial ask that's coming out of this plan. It is a strategic guidance document. However, it is something that we will use to continue to make asks of either local authorities or central government to activate parts of the plan. And that's something we'll talk through in our implementation planning. We've acknowledged in the plan that there is a significant need for improved regional connectivity and we need to collectively advocate for that with our partners at Ikin and Waka Kotahi. And the next phase of this plan is to begin consultation with those agencies. There's an opportunity to support the growth of day trip itineraries from the Littleton cruise berth. There's significant volume coming through there uh, and for day trips, particularly for selling, there's a huge opportunity. Uh, and then we're looking at how we can create regional sustainable transportation. So that's looking at the future of transport and how we can either offset carbon or look at electric buses or other options to create sustainable visitor transport. Our tourism later development is a significant issue nationally, um, but particularly in our districts. A lot of that comes down to worker accommodation. So there is a need to advocate for developing community and workforce housing, temporary accommodation, and working with tourism operators to consider that when they're operating a business, they also need to think about how they're housing their workers. Uh, there's also future technology that can digitalise part of the tourism economy and working with tourism operators to start to uh, look at how they can utilise AI or digitisation to pick up some of their workforce challenges. Uh, you will have seen a little bit of the central government funding that came through the Regional Events Fund that has helped all of us uh, uh, sort of really uplift our events programming. But what we discovered as part of that events uh, fund is that we had uh, no coordinated approach to events. So there were times when Selwyn and Christchurch had quite similar and competitive events on in the same weekend. So as part of this plan, we've acknowledged that there's a real need to start coordinating our event calendars and looking at different event types for different areas. So where Christchurch will focus on, for example, filling Takaha, the Canterbury Multi-Use Arena, we have out outlined that there is an opportunity for Selwyn to uplift some more of its national sporting focus, so Masters Games, and how can that work alongside Christchurch where, let's say, we're hosting FIFA Women's Cup, we do trainings out here in Selwyn. So we start to collectively work together. And I think ICC Women's Cricket World Cup is a really good example of that, where we have training and things out here in Lincoln with some of the teams. Uh, we've acknowledged that there is um, a need to invest in outdoor programming uh, infrastructure to support events. Uh, and we really want to position ourselves as a collective set of districts as the preferred national and international sporting city. 
I did talk about regenerative tourism processes. And one of the things that the plan has outlined is that there's an opportunity to develop a tourism pledge and ensuring that by quality controlling our tourism industry, we get the industry to sign up to a pledge where they commit to carbon offset, uh, social procurement policies, looking at a circular, circular economy where waste can be offset, and ensuring that the benefits of that regenerative economy are here as opposed to done offshore or internationally. Uh, we'd like to develop a carbon footprint measurement app to look at the true impact of tourism on carbon and then how we can offset that. And we also have an opportunity to make river and waterway health um, a huge focus of this destination management plan and one of our measures of success. And finally, one that I think is really exciting for Selwyn and really aligns to your from the land positioning is really moving our destination to the forefront of culinary tourism leadership. Uh, we have the food bowl of New Zealand right here, as you uh, know, and so we have an opportunity to develop with our local communities a culinary festival, a restaurant or hospitality week or month, uh, work with Manifunawai to develop Mahinga Kai, uh, and building on that leadership innovation space and looking at how we can reposition ourselves uh, as a culinary tourism leader. So that is a real kind of also stop tour of the plan. There's a lot more in there. Some of the things we haven't sort of discussed are the opportunity as business events into Pi Conference Centre and doing day trips, uh, working with Mana Fenua to uplift Mana Fenua stories. Um, and, you know, there's a, a lot sitting in the plan. It is draft. We welcome all of your feedback. Um, and so we are going to talk you through next the, the next stages and we welcome questions. Okay. Um, Denise did the, a very good summary of this at the start, so I, I won't dwell on it. But um, ultimately, the criteria that is your board will sign off on the destination management plan as the regional tourism organisation. But the board will be looking for endorsement from the district councils on their parts of that plan before it will sign the uh, final plan off. So we're working through with Denise um, a process of bringing this back to you once we've updated the draft for your um, approval, I think 16th of June, I think it was that you said, Denise. Um, once uh, that uh, sign-off has occurred, we will move into implementation planning and work with Denise and, and Claire and Shay on what that looks like for um, Waimakariri. So happy to take any questions or feedback. Yes. Right. Um, I thank you for your presentation. Um, just, you touched on the last issue with regards to your funding model. And I think I brought this up towards you in September with regards to the fact that you operate under a board and we operate in-house with regards to our tourism. Uh, and I just wondered, are you looking for a funding mechanism across the whole of Canterbury to support your board, um, similar to the Canterbury Museum? which is actually covered by an Act of Parliament. So that would mean that every council would be required to contribute um, to your board um, for um, the work that you do in actually presenting your programme for, um, for tourism. That's one question. The next question I had was with regards to your thoughts on engaging um, various sporting groups. Um, have you actually um, engaged with Sport Canterbury um, with regards and other groups with regards to looking at um, securing uh, facilities and not being in competition with each other? They're my two questions. Thank you. So I um, thank you, Deb. I'll um, uh, address the first one if that's okay. Um, look, absolutely, you raised that question last time, and I think it's a really interesting question. I think funding models are a uh, really interesting area to look at. And when I talk to economic development agencies across the country, most areas have different approaches to this. So uh, we are looking at what lots of other people are doing to see what ideas we can we can steal. It is a time that's really challenging for everybody. We all know that. 
it's challenging for the private sector and it's challenging for the public sector. I think what I can reassure you on is that um, we as, as Christchurch NZ, uh, yes, our majority funding comes through the Christchurch City Council as the CCO, and yes, we are separate from the City Council rather than being part of that, um, that, that particular business unit. Um, I think that's quite helpful for us in Christchurch, and again, it's all different depending on where you are. For us, that allows us to uh, interact in a slightly different way with, with different parts of the private sector. Um, what we at Christchurch and Z are really committed to is enhancing that funding that comes from the City Council to make sure that we amplify it and make it go further than possible, and that as far as possible. Mm -hmm. That's more than likely going to come from central government and private sector rather than from other uh, district councils, but I wouldn't write it off at this point. But um, if we were to do anything like that, it would be something that we would have a very clear value proposition where we could see that we could give you a very clear return on investment on anything that we were asking to. At the moment, it's not something that's something we're looking at actively. I just wouldn't write it off. Um, I'm going to um, let me answer the question that's all kind of if that's okay. This, I feel like I'm going to break this when I carry it. Um, I think to uh, enhance Ali's point that the purpose of this plan is as an influential document that your internal management can use to guide their strategic work programs as well. So it's not just a Christchurch and Z piece of work, it's a very collective piece of work that we'll all use for different intents and purposes to guide our work. Um, to your point about Sport Canterbury, they were engaged in, as part of this process. Uh, they have been in, involved in our workshops. They're a very close uh, stakeholder of ours. We meet with them monthly as part of our um, event <laughs> planning. Uh, there is, as mentioned, work to do to improve um, the crossover that happens. That crossover is less happening in the sports sector and actually more in the entertainment sector. So we feel really well um, supported by Sport Canterbury and uh, I think we've got a really good plan with them moving forwards. Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for the um, report today. Uh, I guess like everything that happens in Canterbury is reliant on what happens in the South Island and everything that happens in the South Island you know, relies on what New Zealand's image is worldwide if we're thinking about uh, tourism and visitors from overseas. Uh, so much of what we have uh, here is uh, New Zealanders moving around and visiting places, and particularly in Selwyn. There's a whole lot about how does Christchurch visit Selwyn. Um, so I'm keen to understand that aspect of the destination management plan, uh, because the key headline, sort of, I'm wondering your third slide in, was how do we drive visitation to Christchurch? And by driving visitation to Christchurch, everyone benefits. And I'm just not sure that that trickle down really um, does the best for Selwyn, because mm -hmm. actually one of our key focuses needs to be how do we get Christchurch to visit mm -hmm. here. Uh, so you can just talk a little bit uh, about that, um, and maybe it's just language, yeah. uh, because it could it could say uh, how we drive visitors to uh, increase people to Oshtahi Christchurch uh, and the districts, rather than the piece that says that's kind of full stop, and then by doing that, all the rest will happen. Uh, second piece is uh, the Akaroa decision. To me, it seems like it could be a chapter within a greater plan rather than a plan of its own. It kind of feels like Akaroa, I mean, yes, it's special and yes, it's different and yes, there's pressures, but I mean, lots of places also have pressures that are different and special, not for cruise ships, but for other reasons. Uh, and if we're thinking about not wanting to create artificial borders between places, but get rid of borders between places and actually having it within the one plan rather than two, to me, would make a little bit more sense. Mm. Uh, and thirdly, the part around Selwyn that was missing, I felt, was Night Sky. Uh, and so we are wanting to put a lot of effort into thinking about Night Sky Reserve um, and for the Craigieburn, uh, Martha's Pass area, and also uh, Tomo to uh, Te Wahora. Mm. Um, so at the moment, that's we're starting that work, um, but that's a key discussion and focus for us as a council, and so we'd like to see that um, in there uh, as well. Right. I'm going to need to um, remember all the questions and answer them. So first one, um, to your point, yes, there's a little bit of semantics in there probably where we need to alter the languaging slightly. When we looked at the data sets and as you go into the plan, it does outline international domestic and residential visitation and outlines that residential Christchurch visitors to the districts are one of the biggest opportunities. Um, and the, I guess the, the languaging is around growing the pie to grow everyone's slice. So to speak. 
speak. So I think there's a really good point there around how we nuance that languaging to sort of showcase that it is about the rising tide of all so that we can look at all visitor sets. And so if the international visitor economy grows in Christchurch and our economy grows, which attracts greater residents, then Selwyn benefits from greater domestic local visitation as an example so um yes to your point we have looked at all of those but we didn't go into it in detail today but i think we'll take that feedback on around nuancing the language uh i, I remember the third question then i'll go to the second oh i'll be so much like that that's right so um the rationale for that is that um, the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment requested that Banks Peninsula have its own specific plan based on outcomes of the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment report on tourism. And so that is where that came from. It was tasked to us by MB. Uh, we do have work to do to make sure that the plans uh, bookend each other really well. Uh, as an example, within Akarawa, there is a focus on limiting cruise ships, but within Littleton, there's uh, an opportunity to grow them and they are both within the Banks Peninsula district so it is um, a really challenging one to work through uh, we will probably look to work out how we can pull the Banks Peninsula part of the plan into this one as well so it becomes one collective document um, but it has become a, a sort of slightly tricky one to navigate because of central government's heightened awareness of the cruise ship challenges um, to Dark Sky, it actually does sit in the destination management plan and was a miss by me. Sorry, I did the um, slides at Trends yesterday. Um, so I think we'll make sure that we pull that one to the top. Uh, and I know that the team uh, I have really focused on that as a focus for both Selwyn and Waimakariri. Uh, and so we'll bring that to you guys as well. So uh, the document is very long, so I apologise. We've tried to compress it into one PowerPoint presentation. Cool. And, and the cycling um, biking piece, obviously Christchurch Adventure Park um, is a great spot. Um, Craig Event Trails within Selwyn, a lot of people visit and we're currently working through a business case uh, around Arthur's Pass to Tomutu. Yeah. Um, so that sort of wasn't highlighted there, but I'm guessing that is picked up. It in does sit in there very heavily. Yeah, it does. Yeah, oh, Everyone has identified cycling and I guess to that um, uh, connectivity piece within um, point number three that actually talks about how we can create connectivity through cycling and hiking as well because they're carbon neutral um, and they're huge opportunities for us to um, increase length of stay and increase slow tourism. So they sit in there. Thank yeah. You. Okay, Sophie. Ooh, my turn came around faster than I expected. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, ladies. It's great, always good to hear from you. Um, I, I, it was really interesting hearing your bits, and I'm quite interested in reading the, the rest of the information because I come from a tourist town, so <laughs> it's always something that interests me. Um, I quite like. So you, sorry, Ralston. Okay, I was born and raised somewhere else. <laughs> yes, Rolls. Yes, that's a wonderful bright light to be at last of this. Um, okay. <laughs> I did like yeah, um, you're referring to like a, um, a, like an ecosystem style approach though that that makes sense because yeah when you go on holiday you you're interested in the bits that you want to go see not you know oh look I've crossed another boundary it's kind of interesting you know especially if you're trying to keep kids interested oh look for that sign what's the next thing that you're saying but um I was interested in the mention of accommodation um in terms of um staff that that is definitely an issue here but i guess our other big problem is accommodation for tourists um so it'd be really interesting if there's anything that comes out of that around how we can attract more hotels or just larger stuff because even with the the sporting um activities one thing we've noticed that we've got fantastic sports facilities but if a team wants to be based out here we're pretty limited unless they're able to use the halls of residence in lincoln mm. um so that's that's a limitation that we've got to deal with at the moment um and I guess my other question was around regenerative tourism, which I absolutely support, but I do find it slightly ironic that we're still talking about that in the context of people traveling internationally by plane and on cruise ships. And there was also mention made of offsets, which there's some reporting coming out at the moment that a lot of offset schemes are not quite what <laughs> um, they could be. So I was just wondering if you could call a little bit about that, thanks. 
Um, so um, I'm going to answer the second question and then um, hand back to Lauren and hope she can remember the first. So just there you go. But it's time to work on that. <laughs> You've got a very good habit of asking lots of questions. You make us work, and why are you even happy here? Yes. Um, uh, so you're, you're absolutely right. The tyranny of distance is a real challenge for um, for New Zealand. And um, uh, what I want to reassure you about is some of the really exciting work that's happening in this region around uh, particularly air travel and making it more carbon neutral. I don't know if you're aware about the Hydrogen Collective, which is um, a, a, a joint agreement between Airbus, Hamburg International Airport, Christchurch International Airport and Fabram, and it's about looking at hydrogen fuel carbon neutral planes. And um, it's a real thing. It's uh, it's going to happen. And our airport is just phenomenally good at this. In fact, it is leading the way in looking at innovative new ways to uh, make that long distance travel much less harmful for the planet. Because you're absolutely right that buying offsets is. Uh, it's very, very high profile at the moment, and, and that's not the solution to things. Um, it's also um, the Christchurch economic ambition that we're responsible for, which does just cover the Christchurch ratepayer boundaries. But I, we, we will work closely with our, our neighbouring um, teams as well to sort of make sure that we're we're all sort of linked up on this. Is absolutely about thinking about a regenerative ecosystem. And again, it's about um, not necessarily just working with regenerative businesses, but thinking about how one business's waste can be another business's uh, um, treasure and used as a starting point. So, and not just moving from a circular econ to a circular economy, but actually really going that next step forward, forward to regenerative. Cruise is more interesting. So, because there are lots of challenges around cruise, and I think the DMP is going to have to lean quite heavily into uh, the role of, for example, ECAN or other um, uh, central government agencies around regulation around cruise. Um, so, but it's something that we have to, uh, we, we don't want to stop cruise overnight. It's, it's brought 123,000 people into our region and that's something that you know we, we really um, acknowledge is an important part of our city and um, regional vibrancy. Um, and to your accommodation point there are sort of two answers to that the first is that there is significant capacity sitting in Christchurch at the current point in time with hotel investment uh, very high and so there's a lot of accommodation sitting there where we kind of need to fill that up to create the, the, the business case that there is a need for more accommodation. And the second part of that is by growing the visitor economy in Selwyn, you create a business case for investment and accommodation. So I think there's a chicken and egg piece there. It's not a case of build it and they will come. By growing the region's visitation, we create the economic imperative for people to invest in that accommodation. Yeah. Okay, Grant. Um, I was interested that you surveyed 10,000 visitors. Um, I guess I was interested in was the response that you've developed in response to the to the survey. Are we are we taking what visitors want and developing what they want, or are we creating what we've done? Saying here, got to take it or leave it. I guess um, I'd be interested in um, a pen portrait of what our average visitor looks like. I mean, if, you, if you're thinking of visitors, perhaps in Hong Kong or. Europe or the states with a pile of brochures. What was the driver to pick up and come to New Zealand, and, and what you know, what are the, what are the key key principles that drive that? Yeah, I think we'll do a tag team on that one. I'll talk about the visitor survey. Um, it was at a point in time where visitation was only just starting to return, so we need to acknowledge that it's an imperfect point in time data point um, and uh, because visitation hadn't returned in great volume, a lot of it was uh, domestic. Uh, visitors, so we, we didn't get the international reach that we would have preferred. Um, so it, it was very much one data point um, amongst uh, all of the resident data. So we haven't developed the destination management plan just on the basis of that visitor feedback. It's been a combination of the resident visitor feedback and stakeholder input. And actually, one of the uh, principles we agreed right at the beginning of this whole piece of work was that um, resident would always trump visitor. So if there was a conflict, which actually we've seen very few of, um, if there was a conflict, then we would go on the side of what the resident was looking for rather than what the visitor was looking for, because that social license to operate is so important. Um, so, um, yeah, it was it was the resident's voice was loud. So your perception of 
what is the percentage domestic versus international that will come out of this program? Is it likely to be 50, 50, 60, 40? What, have you got, uh, uh, got an imperative? Yeah, so it's probably, I, I guess, uh, an international visitor is higher value. Um, so we look at an international visitor is about $8 to every $1 that a resident spend. A domestic visitor is about $5 and you sort of, you end up with an average of about six to one. Um, Pre-COVID, we were at 60-40. That probably felt uh, about right, but we acknowledge that the domestic opportunity provides more sustainability in times of crisis. So we need to make sure that our brand is really strong to domestic visitors. So it may be that we shift to a 50-50. Uh, it's a really nebulous time at the moment post-COVID. We don't know what a lot of markets are going to do and how they're going to respond. We haven't had, for example, Chinese borders open over a high season. So we're sort of in a wait and see uh, until next season to start to understand where some of that comes from. And it is why the destination management plan outlines the need for better data sets so that we can actually start to to review and manage. Uh, in terms of visitor insights that we're getting from offshore, we really rely on our partners for that. So that's uh, Air New Zealand, Tourism New Zealand. Um, so those agencies sort of work long haul on our behalf because really our investment in international um, is just a drop in the ocean and wouldn't really be worth it, to be honest. Yeah. Nicole? <laughs> Thanks, Vet. It's been good to listen to what you guys had to say. Um, the, just building on with Sam talking about others uh, past out to 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 Waihua, I mean we've I mean we see that we've got quite a unique thing there, and especially with the rail going up as well, and and there is quite a gap in great rides around our area and close to such a big population base of of Christchurch. As, as well, but um, got a couple of questions. So you talked about um, you've got a carbon app and talking about offsets and um, Sophie briefly said, but I mean, the Climate Change Commissioner has come out quite strongly against like offsetting, like planting trees as offsets, which when you hear offsets, that's mostly what we're doing. So like to hear a little bit. So no, I just wanted to clarify a couple yeah. of things that these sit as strategic recommendations and actually an implementation plan will come out of this where we actually put okay so you have actually got implementations in. So okay. this is sort of suggesting okay. that as a destination we need to do more work work yeah. around regenerative tourism and what does measuring carbon first look like there is no app so that's suggesting that okay. could be an option. Okay. And then second how do we offset or create a regenerative tourism economy? So these are ideas that sit in a very kind of uh, iterative space and then we'll move into implementation. And I think to your point about Arthur's Pass as well, that's where that sits is sort of, okay, how, now that we've got these strategic recommendations, the next phase is how do we implement them and, and whose priority is what and what do we want to focus on? We, we're not going to be able to do everything that sits in this plan as well. Yep, yep, I can understand. Yeah understand that and the um the other question around is and let's talk about the cr cruise ships themselves i mean they're pretty self-contained mostly as as well so the question is is how much sort of benefit there is to where they're going to um so i'll just leave that <laughs> the cruise ships actually do um resource themselves from the airport so christchurch is a resupply port so for example they get a lot of their fresh fruit and vegetables from Selwyn onto their ship so there are other benefits to cruise that aren't just passengers hopping on and off um so i think uh, there's a probably a piece of messaging around cruise ships that needs to be done that sort of talks about their greater impact on the economy and yes they do just come in for a day but there are other options around turnaround as well and which we can start to look at if we think that cruise is going to be a viable tourism option for our districts in the future okay phil um thank you very much for your time um i've got a question about the geography of uh, Canterbury as opposed to where people live. Um, you were talking about activating the regions, but if we active uh, by activating Christchurch, which is basically geographically residential and retail. 
Conversely, Selwyn is a vast and beautiful area with blank hate places and beautiful things to see. Um, so there's two questions here. First of all, from your studies, what do tourists want? And second one, are you considering uh, Christchurch tourism as local tourists for Selwyn? And how, how are you going to move people? Well, what's the planning from your plan about getting that big mass of people into our geographical area. Yeah, yeah. So actually my challenge would be, look, I absolutely understand that for Selwyn, which is where I live, by the way, and I agree, it's very beautiful, although I would argue that Christchurch is too. Um, uh, um, absolutely understand and hear that for Selwyn, Christchurch visitors are a big part of the visitor economy. As Christchurch NZ, our responsibility is not to attract people to Selwyn. So that's actually the challenge for this group of people here. And that comes back to Lauren's point about we create together the strategic framework, which is what the destination management plan is. And then it, when it gets to implementation, so how that actually comes to life and how that happens. So is something for you to um to support but what uh, what we can do and will be doing at Christchurch NZ is is as Lauren said that our part of this will be about raising the tide for everyone and making the pie bigger so so and then your part will be partly that and partly does that make sense uh yeah it does in terms of that but it's very it's very very uh you're talking about developing the uh the whole area area improving regional con 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 connectivity uh, growing the districts together, creating regional ev ev event plans, but you're just focusing on Christchurch. Absolutely. So, our, so this is where this gets slightly complicated. As Christchurch NZ, we have been tasked with helping to pull together the destination management plan for a much broader region. And so we've worked really closely with Denise and Claire and the team, just as we have with our colleagues in Waimakariri and in Ashburton, to make sure that this plan reflects the whole region and this boundaryless view that visitors have of it, because that's the only way this is going to work. But in, when it comes to there's a difference between the strategy and then the implementation, when it gets to the implementation, there are going to be parts of it that we absolutely have to do together. So if we're looking at regional connectivity, that's something we should all look at together. But there are going to be other parts that are just for Selwyn to consider or just for YMAT to consider or just for Christchurch to consider because we all have slightly different parts to help in this whole. What's really important is that we're all looking and pulling in the same direction. Thank you. Elizabeth? Hi, I think you guys have done a brilliant job in remembering everybody's detailed questions. I'm just going to add sort of three things together as well for you. So you might want to take one each. Um, so in terms of you talking about the offsets, I'm going to ask if there is like what we have with Heart Foundation and, and other things. Will there be a tick slash star type program so that people can easily identify um, when they want for things that are A, when they're registering or B, when they're consumers? Um, and also, you talked about sophistication tourism, which I actually love, it's for me. Um, much like the attractions of Akaroa, is there going to be a view on including, supporting and encouraging the heritage tourism, uh, which involves both Māori and Pākehā early history, and will there be protection and identification, because I feel that's really needed to be included in the plan because we're seeing um, not a lot of protection in some of our areas, particularly over the heritage stuff. Mm. Um, Parking, I just want to highlight that there's been a fair amount of unhealthy publicity amongst the international travel community regarding New Zealand's overzealous attitudes towards parking compliance. Uh, sometimes it's warranted for sure, but at times parking wardens were in the wrong, issuing large fines that have taken tourist weeks and a lot of money to remedy at great cost and effort. Will you be able to look at simplifying this particular topic for tourists moving forward? Okay, <laughs> number one was carbon. Uh, so yes, uh, within the recommendations, there is uh, the idea that there would be a pledge or some form of certification that we might be able to support the industry to go through uh, so that they can all commit to one sort of benchmark and that we can utilise that not only as, um, you know, a really amazing environmental opportunity, but a bit of a marketing piece as well, where we can say, look at our industry here, it is truly carbon neutral or, you know, working towards that. 
Uh, so that's number one. Number two, sophisticated uh, travellers. I also consider myself a sophisticated traveller. Um, that is very uh, particularly focused on probably domestic and Australian visitors um, and how we're positioning ourselves. So how we're talking about uh, the experiences that we're providing. Culinary um, leadership is definitely within that. Uh, heritage uh, and, uh, and telling on a whenua stories, they sit within um, the plan. They are really more mandated in some ways. Or telling on a whenua stories, I think, is, is something that we can collectively do. Mm. The heritage protection stuff sort of sits more with the central government. Um, but I think we have, within implementation, a, a role to play where we identify what those core heritage landmarks are, how we connect them, and how we tell these stories. Uh, protection car parks uh haven't thought about car parking that's a good good one to consider i think um as we uh, start to engage with uh various agencies around some of the implementation including ecan and waka kotahi uh, we'll start to think about some of that stuff and i think some of these points can be raised and lifted and shifted to a national platform mm -hmm. instead of a, re a regional plan so that was my quick answer i hope i haven't missed anything <laughs> Yeah. Welcome. Uh, good. Thank you for coming along. Um, I'm delighted to see what you've put in front of us. Uh, many years ago, I had the tourism portfolio here at the council, and we established a, a wine and food trail. I don't know if it's still operating. And I was very aware in those days that well, I think we were more associated with Ashburton for our tourism uh, than than Christchurch City. Um, and uh, you know, you talked ski fields before automatic, but you said Mount Hutt. Well, I'm sorry. We've got, the, we've got the sensational sale in six in the Craigieburn Valley, um, and, and uh, within an hour across it. So, you know, that's all part of the story that we want to tell about uh, about Selwyn. Um, well, my question is: um, we have a, a Bachelor of Tourism Marketing at Lincoln University, um, supported with uh, Stephen Espiner and Joanna Fountain. I'm just wondering if you've had any input from those people on. On the on the area as well. Yes, we work very closely with the Lincoln team, um, right. Joanna in particular, uh, and then of course David, who was previously there, he's still um, involved. Couldn't get his fingers out of tourism, um, and so yeah, we, we work really closely with them. We also um, we do a reciprocal uh, partnership with them, where we also present to students, and they come in sometimes and shadow us, and there's a, a whole lot of involvement and some great thought leadership coming out of that school. Fantastic. I, we had a Pim Hill debate hot topic a few months ago on tourism. I don't know if any of you attended. Um, I upset Mr. Espinel when I suggested that we needed accommodation at uh, at Arthur's Pass so we could get those people who come off the, the train and get a bed night out of them on the way through. Um, I don't think he was very impressed with the idea of a, a hotel in the National Park. Uh, but, but I'd still like to see it investigated at some time. So I'm, I'm really pleased to see the communication and the collaboration going on in this project and the fact that we're working as a collective, and I wish you well and look forward to the next steps. Thank you. Elizabeth, could you put your microphone off, please? Shane? Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Tēnā katoa, e ngā haue, pai, e ngā mātā waka, e ngā wai wai tapu, e ngā hara mai, e ngā mana whenua. Mr. Chair, Sam, David, our staff, visitors, um, thank you very much for attending today and I thank you very much for your report. Um, it does speak of the cross boundaries, partnerships, uh, relationships, uh, and the uniqueness of each of our districts on a region wide basis, uh, being that Christchurch is in the name would be the hub of the entry points. I'm really looking forward to seeing the um, uh, Tao Māori influence flow through this document as well, because mm -hmm. it tends to get uh, put in in the notes, but actually not woven through the document. And if I search on um, on Google or whatever it might be, one of the main attractions of coming to Aotearoa, New Zealand, is the culture, mm -hmm. and uh, something that we are bound ourselves in here and, and pride ourselves in is uh, not only a district, a council, but a country as well. So I'm looking forward to that. My question is um, one of the quick ones for Selwyn. You've spoken about some of them being a combination, perhaps some hotel, hotels, that sort of thing. Uh, what, what, what are the opportunities, the quick wins that you see, particularly for Selwyn? How can we uh, engage more of the market as a hub and spoke um, that you've spoken about? How do we um, complement the, the plan more so that 
it, it, to me, it looks like there's good flow. So there'll be the hub and then there'll be opportunities for those that are arriving to participate in different um, sections or sectors. But culture, I think, will be one of the main, um, perhaps, yeah, through collaboration. So thank you. So I'll hang, thank you. I'll hand back to Mon to answer the quick wins question. But the, um, just in terms of uh, Mon Fenner engagement, I, I couldn't agree more. It's one of our, it's one of the jewels in 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 what we have to offer as as a as a nation. Um, and I'm really proud of some of the steps we're starting to take in this space. Um, so the work we did with Sal GP and Nati Feki was a really fantastic partnership. Uh, my two had already are very, very heavily involved in the brand work that we've just done as a city in Christchurch, um, a huge partner in that, and also um, heavily involved in trends. And anyone who's been at trends and seen the, the, the weaving of cultural diversity through what we offer, um, uh, both in terms of, I think, the authenticity of that, which it really feels like it's starting to kind of, we're starting to actually get there, uh, but also in terms of the way that, that our visitors respond to it. It would make you realize, so look, we absolutely agree. It, we, the last thing we would ever want from this is to feel like it was an appendix or a token uh, drop-in. So I can reassure you we agree. Yeah. Um, and in regards to the plan, we're uh, engaging with Mana Whenua. We do, do still have consultation work to be done, um, including uh, we're working through hopefully the gifting of a name for this particular piece of work, which can then cascade down through the document so that we can start to uplift some of that. But of course, as you know, that takes time and really meaningful uh, co-partnership. Uh, quick wins. Look, first of all, your team are doing an amazing job. They really are. Uh, what I'm seeing this year at Trends is a huge lift from where Salwyn was last time they exhibited at Trends. So um, I have seen, and, and apologies, I've been in Stroll for five years, and my view is that what the team are doing around building trade capability and making sure that your tourism operators are capable of understanding the commission structure and working with international agents is fantastic. Uh, the from the land positioning works really well. Um, we have acknowledged, of course, that culinary leadership is really an opportunity for someone and it already takes your positioning and lifts it one up. You know, quick wins around visitation are usually achieved through big events, um, you know, activating um, deals and making sure that visitors are really aware of what your offering is. Um, and partnering with your neighbours and, and, you know, the team are already do, doing a lot of those things and I just want to kind of to talk what you said um, about, you know, making sure that we are focusing on quick wins in the implementation with a long-term view that some of these outcomes from the plan are legacy outcomes that will really shift the dial. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Just one of the things you were discussed just before about trends, can you tell us a little bit more about that, how that's working for you? And Sure. Yeah. So Trends is the largest international travel trade show in New Zealand. It brings in um, around 333 international buyers uh, and international airlines where they come to see New Zealand uh, and do their deals, do their business on, on the floor. So they meet with tourism operators to understand more about New Zealand and then they plan out their travel trade itineraries for their clients. Um, they usually work between five and ten years out. Uh, they are on the ground, the businesses it's being done is probably worth about half a billion dollars. Um, and for us, and to Christchurch, about 70% of all international visitors use a travel agent, which might surprise some people, but those are the influences that make those decisions. So there's 1,500 delegates at the moment uh, at Tapai Christchurch Convention Centre, and they are losing voices and networking and um, having the time of their lives. Um, and I'm very disappointed that the weather isn't so great because they're heading out on the Transalpine today and there were some helicopter flights. Um, but anyway, that's okay because um, it's all about the business that we do on the ground. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your presentation and we okay. hope to see you back to talk to us at regular intervals to let us know what's happening and also uh, working with Denise who can also let us know. But uh, I just like to break for 10 minutes well, for Smoko. So uh, if you'd like to stay, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to stand around and talk, you're welcome. Thanks. Yeah. Oh.
so now look, I and you've got an amazing Running with the poem, so yeah, we don't have an army, so 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 we don't Kind of uh, idea, but it starts to outline a position about we can do this ourselves. Mm. So, mm. Hey, mm. Last year, but it will generate a space. Mm. Oh, oh, so, that's a good time. I think, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fixed time I think, that, I think that day is such a great opportunity for us to yeah. almost change by the whole day and say, Exactly. And it also means there's like a little bit of a question. Oh, it's not true, so you can question it. Oh, yeah. plus it's just my, that was no, that's right. We think um, one, one of the things we'll be coming back to around in that time. We think we need to think of the things to attract some of those. That's an LTP discussion. We have to absolutely end Absolutely. And we've shown that when we have these things here, people come. Yeah. That's a great example. Because that's what we actually yeah. 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 So yeah, no, no, no. It's a big investment, I think, yeah. in that. As well as some of that stuff about getting a presence to the council as that is that facilitating yeah, um, innovation. You know, if you're a new district to the council, you know how that was because of the it's there. Yeah, so it's the make it should have worked better. Something that incredibly which was embraced the dance strong and was seen. And and we had an annual plan with you in the last year that was still. That was 140 people who were No, no, yeah. I can't remember how many people were living out there dominating their own planet. So, yeah, well, remember, we're just looking at the whole thing. That one is well, actually. We, I don't know how it would describe that, how we went to the um, every government agency, how many of our residents use services that we're funding through those insurance, and none of them have anything on that. Oh, well. They just know that oh, yeah. people yeah. need to look at an integrate. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so we actually need to be, so we want to do a survey of not less than 4,000, which is about social well being. It's not just yeah. the mm. negative, mm. but what are you proud of? And what are the mm. things that you love about your area? What are the opportunities in terms of mental health? You know, do you go to students with their own name? What would make it, you know, that, that sort of stuff? So actually, we can, we can so we start with the feedback from the community, and so in a sense, we don't need further, we will go out in the LTC, but it should be reflected in the book yeah, and yeah. the plan that we're putting out. Yeah. We heard to move on, yeah, yeah. so we've grown the yeah, 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 way. Yeah, yeah. So I think, yes, I like, I, I love to use the text in LT. Um, We've got a district, the, the Gregory of Canterbury is this beautiful district that starts with hills and ends at the sea. It spends 60, 70 years 
in our patch in four days in Christchurch's patch. And that's, oh, that's a great yeah, strategy. and that's where we need to be spending things. That's why it's like this, because the water tells us where the water is. Oh, no, well, one of the cool things in that was that you can get it
Yeah, you think of the stuff, all right? Oh, Okay, thank you. We'll go on to read which part of the, is the community full summer season and future plans report and get James to speak to that, please. And just um, an apology that the uh, structural assessment report wasn't attached to the report that went out. Um, that's now been remedied and you should have a copy in front of you as well as having um, sent the electronic copy yesterday. And But the key findings of that um, of that report are included in the report that J James is about to speak to you about. Thank you, Bob and Denise. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Uh, today we've got a report on the, um, the community for the summer season and future plans for uh, consultation as well. Uh, there's four key parts to the report. One is a review of the 2022-23 summer season. Uh, I'll start there and just give a brief overview of some of that, the key uh, things that were going on. I think uh, Firstly, it was a far easier season operationally than the, season, the two seasons before, where we didn't have to restrict numbers into pools uh, and have event a number of restrictions either. Uh, that made life a, a lot easier for both operational staff and for customers knowing where they could go and, and when they could do that. Um, a couple of key key things that happened, just to note, was a pool pump failure at Darfield Pool. Uh, that's probably played down a little bit there in the report, but essentially that was actually a, a pool pump that caught on fire didn't catch the rest of the facility on fire, luckily, uh, and the electrical system worked as it should and tripped the, uh, the pump out, which was great, uh, and the fire extinguished itself with the pipe that burst around it. So it could have been bad, and I, I guess that talks to the fact that of the ageing pines in Darfield and the works that are currently underway to, to remedy that. Um, the, that work will be done by the time the next season rolls around in November. Southbridge Pool, there's an incident to note there involving a head injury on the hydroslide. I was a young uh, young man went down the hydroslide and hit his head a couple of times uh, and was rescued by lifeguards, unconscious at the time the lifeguards got to him. Uh, serious incident uh, that was handled well by the staff and, and was perhaps a, a good illustration of why we staff some of these sites uh, when there's a potential for accidents like that to happen. Moving on to Kalinchi Pool. Uh, Kalinchi Pool is volunteer driven. Um, council staff go and assist with filling the pool, cleaning the pool, and, and try and keep an eye on it as best we can in terms of weekly checks or, or twice weekly checks. Um, I think there's been a movement away this year, uh, in the last season, sorry, for from some of the volunteers. A little bit older, but was in the pool, so mm -hmm. uh, and then they as a what these things. So uh, the decision's been made to make sure we get a really good roster system in, in place and upskill those volunteers and make sure we've got a good roster of volunteers before that pool reopens. Um, so putting perhaps a bit more pressure back on onto that uh, those volunteers in that community if they want to see that pool run. Uh, moving on to Sheffield Pool. Um, so Sheffield Pool has been lifeguarded by employed council lifeguards for the last six seasons. And it's kind of in line with, with what's been happening, like you said, at Southbridge Pool and Darfield Pool, where there is deep water. Um, there are hazards in that in that area with uh, driving boards, et cetera. And we don't obviously don't want any accidents to happen without trained staff on site. Um, it had a, quite a low turnout this year, although it was up on previous seasons, which is really good to see. Uh, the hours had changed a little bit as well, so that's important to note. Uh, the hours were reduced slightly to allow our staff to uh, not have to be sent on from Darfield to relieve them for their breaks. Uh, but it seemed to work fairly well um, on the most part for the community, although there was some feedback around extending those hours back out again. You'll see uh, that there's some concerns around the asset condition of Sheffield Pool. Uh, this has been raised a few times before to council. Uh, and 
there's also a report in front of you, a structural report in front of you, outlining some of those concerns, especially with the structural integrity of the pull tub. The pull tub, to be fair, has done a great job. It's 70 odd years old, um, and it's on a site that has had a bit of a thrashing in terms of getting some flooding, getting some land movement, etc. cetera. Um, so it is at end of life. And we're at the stage where we need to start thinking about what our options are moving forward and what direction we want to go with that facility. Um, in the report from Power Phoenix, there are some commentaries around the site's suitability relating to flood risk. Uh, it has had, we, have, we have had some issues with the driveway, nothing specific around the pool um, in my tenure with council, um, other than some sediment dropping into the pool and some silt into the pool. Um, but it does also speak to the fact that there's a lot of water and that comes down that hill and that land does get quite saturated from time to time. Um, the apparent movement of the pool tub being empty is probably the, of the most concern. It does sort of signal that the um, the tub is failing, and certainly from from the staff's point of view, we are putting a lot of water into that pool to keep it running. Uh, and it does that does indicate that the pool tub is failing. The concrete in that pool is un uh, is, is not reinforced, so it's it's just an unreinforced concrete tub. Uh, and so there will be some concern around what might be happening behind that wall um, if we if we need to investigate that and, and what that what that might bring. I suppose part of that will be what decisions are made today around consultation and where we want to go in the future with with how much investigation goes on as part of that. Um, there is mention of uh, the structure the structural suitability of the pergola on site. That's a relatively minor issue. Um, another important thing to note is that the community-based uh, community group, the Locals Club, have sought information from council about what, what options are available and they've done some survey work out, at, um, out in Sheffield with locals around what, what where to next and what could happen with that pool. Um, part of that was to remove the necessity for life guards so that hours could be extended uh, and We've put an indicative capital investment of five hundred thousand dollars in in terms of shelling up that pool. Where that number comes from is uh, Acom's initial guesstimate at it. it. That will get tightened up as they report back to us in the next four weeks. But essentially, um, it was four hundred eleven thousand dollars to do similar work at Salon of Product Centre. Uh, that didn't include any um, professional fees. Any contingency so that's that's baseline dollars uh, and that was a, obviously a very easy to access site um, so that that number isn't obviously set in stone but it's indicative of what it may cost and finally moving on to uh, the recommendations um, the recommendations in front of you there have a, a polar uh, recommendations so this, they're not set in terms of where we could go I think it would be important to note in option one that it's mentioned close Sheffield pool immediately with operational savings of $70,000 per annum. Uh, we do also previously in the report signal that there's no need to close the pool in, in immediately as well. So that could be changed to close the pool uh, in the next two years with operational savings of $70,000 per annum uh, as an option. Uh, so that's Again, none of these are set in stone. We can um, we can change those around a little bit if, if need be in terms of recommendations. Uh, but we do need to get the views of the community on this facility and understand and give some direction about where we're going and what we're doing. Because at the moment, there's a lot of uh, I, I I think there's a lot of confusion in the community about where to and what what's happening with both the Darfield facility as well as uh, the Sheffield facility. Happy to take questions. Thank you, James. Um, Phil, uh, before we leap into the Sheffield pool, sorry for the pun. Um, I wanted to, I oh know, you're all that. Um, the Kalinchi pool. I wanted to talk about Kalinchi pool uh, and about the, um, with 80 visits per year, only 10 access keys sold. Um, there's, no, there's not a lot of economic data here about that particular pool. Um, it doesn't seem to be very, 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 very viable as a as a as a council entity. Full stop. Now, I guess I'd be interested to hear, hear from now the councillor too, but from the from that patch about what the community thinks of the pool too. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, so um, it's actually a fairly cheap pool to run. It's not heated. 
Um, the asset itself is just a, an old school pool concrete tub that is, has been painted and but because of the low use, it, it lasts, seems to last for a, a long time. Uh, well, there's no staff costs except for staff that are driving past the Southbridge that go in and check that facility anyway. Um, so from that point of view, it's relative, the costs are essentially chemical dosing um, and a small maintenance budget. So it's, it's pretty it's a few thousand dollars a year. I can't give you the exact figure off the top of my head, but I'm thinking three or four thousand dollars to run that facility. Um, so it is low cost, um, but it's also take your point low use as well. And the usage has certainly been declining as those families in that area have grown up and got a bit older and the kids are no longer engaging that side. <laughs> Um, thanks for your report, James. Uh, I guess I have a few concerns around this. Um, is some of it is an information that's been communicated with the community, and I think it adds a wee bit of fuel to the fire around transparency. Um, some of the decisions I think maybe are being used as excuses. Uh, the flooding, and we talk about compromise of that, it's the whole township was affected by the flood damage and council is aware of this and that uh, there is nothing they can do to stop the flooding in the township. Um, and that decisions have been neglected for a long time on improving or upgrading the tub for many years and now that the community will suffer because of lack of investment and maintenance. Um, the pergola provides crucial sunshade in the swimming season and allows families to picnic on the lawn at the pool. Um, but as you say, it's relatively minor. So uh, do as you wish, we could take it down. And even the locals, I think, would take it down for you if you wanted to save some money. Um, when we talked about the locals club survey, 98% um, okay. of survey respondents said yes to repairing and reducing the depth of the pool. Um, I would be interested to see the cost breakdown uh, of the court. Um, sometimes council seen this as a proverbial cash cow, and uh, I'm hard pressed to sort of take those figures on board. Um, you can build a new tool for half of that amount of money. Um, and there's a lot of community volunteers in Sheffield that would be more than happy to take on um, duties of water testing, uh, access issues um, aren't just around the pool, it's around uh, the whole community having general concerns around the road safety on State Highway 73 with kids walking and cycling to school and there's no safe crossing point. So regardless of the pool's operation, this issue won't actually go away. Um, I would like to move a motion to amend option one to retain the first two points in point three to read, consult on the long-term plan, the future of Sheffield Pool, whilst maintaining operation until such findings are found. Uh, I don't like the wording of close Sheffield Pool immediately remaining in this report if we move it. Yeah. You've got a second for your recommendation? Yeah, you know, yeah. Moving that's formal. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's open for discussion. Discussion. So, can someone just write that down so we know what we're actually doing? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Should we write it on paper and hand it to the girls? Thank you. Um, with regards to the last recommendation um, that's just been moved, um, I had a query around um, the Sheffield pool as well with regards to tab nine mentioning the closing of the Sheffield pool immediately. Um, and then we went to tab 10, which is another tab, um, section 3.20, which is operational summary. And then I read we've got a preparation of a phase two of the Darfield redevelopment um, plan being started through Armitage Williams. Now, if I want some clarification that um, that we are closing we an option one under the community pools and the recommendation that we receive the pool summer report um, is to close the Sheffield pool. And then we go to tab 10, and then we are 
automatically have approved, without it going through to the long-term plan, the redevelopment of phase two of um, the Darfield pool through Armitage Williams, which I understand has started. So I'm a little bit confused. Can you actually... The, the summer pool way? development is in two stages. The first stage was done last winter. Then the second stage has been done this winter. That budget was approved by council as part of the last long-term plan at $1.7 million. And then it came back to council for um, increase in capital budget to $2.39 million. I think that's the number. Um, with inclusion of Hyder Slide, Toddler's Wet Deck, and Bleacher Seating. So that, that might be where the confusion is, is that that is one project that's been pre-approved um, by council and has taken two seasons to uh, be implemented because of the fact that we don't want to shut down for a summer season. So, so when I sorry when I read option one, and I've got um, with regards to the closure of the Sheffield pool, um, and then it mentions about the um, Darfield the. Um, plan for the initial stage of an indoor sport and recreation facility in Darfield to be built in 2029. That's a different facility that we're looking at at a cost of 15 million. Correct. They're not the same. Correct. Okay, thank you. Option. Option one. Yeah, point three. Point three. Okay. Uh, Kira, thank you, Bob, Mr. Chair. And thanks, James, for your report. And I hear you just ran a marathon, so well done there. Yeah, good to have you back at one piece. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for your report. Uh, and also, um, with regards to Lydia's uh, amendment, I, I too think that immediately gives uncertainty in the process, even though it's at a long term. Uh, and the, for the long term plan, it just gives uncertainty for the community having the word immediately in there. So rephrasing it, I think, would take a lot of the angst away from uh, from perhaps all the anxiety away from it. The, the decision, though, will come as the long-term plan and a wider strategy of all of the pools, uh, pools as um, Councillor Dean has mentioned as well, with Kalinchi and the like. So really, we need to be working before the long-term plan to provide a strategy out to the public that gives them access to um, facilities that everybody else has the same access to, nice, warm, comfortable facilities, pool facilities for all of our district within their location. So I'm hoping that will come out in the report that perhaps Mark Wykers is putting together in the reserves report. Um, my question is just around the increase in uh, usage for the pools and it's something that's come up in the draft annual plan. So please don't feel that you have to answer it now because it will probably come back around the increase or the, the um, installation, I think it was the annual membership for the Aquatic Centre and the increase of the, of the cost was one of the questions. So that, that is my question, considering we've had an increase of um, usage uh, and um, the basis of that increase and uh, the increased revenue and all that type of stuff, I guess that's your department, obviously. But I can talk to that uh, question now if you'd like. But, um, that, uh, that increase that was proposed to the annual, or was discussed through the annual plan, wasn't comparing apples with apples, I would, that would be the way I'd put it. Um, so there's an annual membership fee um, and there's a pay monthly um, as you go type fee. Um, the annual fee still exists and was increased by 10% and that went through fees and charges through council. Sure. Um, yep. And the other fee is if you take the ongoing monthly fee and extrapolate that out across the year, then there's a difference. But that's a new that's a new membership fee that um, hasn't existed. So if you take those two numbers and compare, if you take the monthly fee and you take the annual fee and you compare them, yes, there's a... a High level of difference, but there always has been. If you take the existing annual fee and the um, the increased annual fee, it's ten percent different. Uh, ten percent difference. That number hasn't actually moved for the last five five years, so that hence the increase. Okay, thank you. That was my question. Is it fair? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So this one comes round, and it is a difficult question. But as as an ex councillor. Reminded us recently, the idea is that we make the hard decisions, not necessarily the popular ones. Um, uh, Lydia mentioned that council can be seen as a cash car. And yes, we can. But that's literally only on the basis of us rating for the money that we spend. Like We don't have this giant pit of money. Um, it literally comes from residents across the district in various different ways. Um, and we all know about the cost of living. We heard plenty about that on Monday. This particular site, Sheffield Pool, is under four different titles. 
council only owns part of the land that it sits on. The flood risk is real and it's increasing just because it affects the entire township. That's actually more reason to consider it as a serious reason to, um, it's, it's a serious factor in this decision. The cost of dis renovation is, looks pretty high already. And based on the report, honestly, I'd be surprised if it didn't increase to at least a million. Um, and to be honest, renovating Sheffield Pool would delay, um, it would be detrimental to the future of a, a Darfield facility, simply because the money gets diverted somewhere else, the staff time is diverted somewhere else. The resources in general are elsewhere. And the other point I wanted to make was that Ralston does have a fantastic pool, yes. There's also nearly 30,000 people who live here. And then when you count in the other townships that are within 10 minutes drive of Rolleston, that's the vast majority of, Rolls of the Selwyn district. And that is why there is a big facility here. And that decision was made before I got on council, but I can totally understand it. West Melton, Prelton, Lincoln do not have pools. They do not even have a toddler pool. Um, they're all in the same drive time of Rolleston as Sheffield is to Darfield and Kerwee is to Darfield. Even Leeston, which does have a, a small kids pool, is the same drive time to Southbridge, which does have a bigger pool. Um, so I, I guess I want to raise that just as a, I agree, I, I can accept that Sheffield loves and appreciates its 70 year old pool, but it's almost a wee bit of exceptionalism to expect that it will continue forever. And I hate saying that, but it's because we're talking about a million dollars. Um, I also want to note that Springfield School has a pool. We've never really discussed whether there's a possibility of there's some sort of partnership deal there, particularly on weekends and over school holidays, making use of that facility, which is also less than 10 minutes drive from Sheffield. Um, I'm happy for us to consult more with the community around the future of Sheffield Pool and the LTP because I think this sort of decision is, it is a big decision, but I believe that the motion should realistically include a note of, you know, at least acknowledge the fact that the report here says that the pool could open next season and the next, the season following that is already a wee bit iffy um, because otherwise potentially propping it up, you know, as I previously mentioned, this decision has been put off several times for various reasons. You don't want to keep putting it off. <laughs> it actually has to be a decision this time. Yeah. Um, but if we're going to consult with the community, it cannot just be Sheffield and it cannot just be Malvern. It has to be the whole district because the whole district is going to pay for this. Um, and the whole district, you know, if we want to have a second recent <coughs> multi-sport facility or, you know, um, swim facility with a swimming pool that is located in Malvern, we're all going to be paying towards it. Um, so yeah, there's no questions there. That's just me making statements. Thanks. Right. Yeah, I'm supporting um, what Rudy is trying to achieve here because I believe that um, the local club, the local community, have gotten behind and started to look for solutions to what they do with their asset. And I think um, to send a signal to them that it's closing this year. Uh, though not fully intended, uh, is, leaves us as a council in very bad grace as far as getting a community to engage in consultation and then um, you've already made your decision, uh, which we get accused of in multiple times. And I do agree with Sophie that the, the pool has serious issues. I, I do believe it's in the wrong place um, for multiple reasons that Sophie has outlined. But we need to give this community a, the opportunity to look at solutions uh, I'm very aware, I've been made aware recently by Councillor Miller of, of uh, what the TITAP community have achieved at their school with the pool. And um, I do think that um, for this to go ahead, the Sheffield community needs to get into to discussions with the, with the school community to see if they can combine and put something together on a new site to the future with volunteer local uh, help and in, in the community involvement, which I, uh, which I know is strong in our rural communities as is most likely to happen. So that is why I've backed uh, this resolution today so that it can go forward. And Councillor McKinnis, you talked about um, 
consultation with the whole community, the LTP will achieve that. Because we, we put it into the LTP, it goes to the whole community, and uh, everybody will get to have a say who pays pool rate. So I think that's a, an efficient way forward. Thank you. Wow. Sorry, you know, I thought it was further than a list than that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm in the Sophie camp, to be fair. Um, I think we're dodging a hard decision. We've all been to the site. Um, it's very difficult for children to get there uh, and access the site and you know safely. It's um, facilities. The tub itself is not user friendly or in the right place. Um, you wouldn't build a pool there now. Um, the realities of it is, as Sophie said, um, it's a nine minute drive to Darfield, um, which is very short in anyone's terms. So, um, what are we? trying to achieve here by um, saying, let's keep the Seafield pool going. I am supportive of Council Lyle's suggestion that um, a, a better idea would be to enable the local community to site a community pool operated by the school on the school site. That would make more sense. Um, and if using it loosely as um, saving one year's 70,000 saying, well, the council might contribute that to the establishment of a community-based pool on the Sheffield School. Um, if you open it for another season, you're sending, spending 70000 which could be directed to a new facility. So I think there's a bit of give and take by the council. I think perhaps rather than voting on this resolution, I'd, I'd encourage us to give the staff time to go away and think about some of the options we've put forward. Because I think by voting today on this resolution, you're tying yourself in. I think in some respects, it's the most clever report I've ever seen because you spent all your time talking about the Sheffield pool when the big thing on the report is actually voting on an indoor facility at Darfield. <laughs> so clever work by the team <laughs> that we are actually voting to say we're going to um, plan for an indoor sport and recreation facility, which by the way, is, is not a swimming pool. It's a, a basketball court, what we're saying. Um, in 2029, which has additional land, which could attach an aquatic facility to that. So if you did that as well, potentially rule of thumb, another 10 to 12 million. So we're talking a $32 million decision today. I don't think that's, you don't make those kind of decisions with this level of information. And um, I think give the opportunity for, for Lydia and, and uh, Bob to go back to their communities through the community board, talk about what we've heard today and talk about some of the options because um, I don't. I couldn't vote in favour of this at the moment because I think you're voting for a status quo or tying the council to an extreme level of capital expenditure, which we haven't debated strongly enough. I think Sam is before me. Okay. Okay. Um, I thank you for the report. Uh, I think the first thing is we want people to be safe at the facility um, and can, to be able to use it well. Uh, and you've talked about the uh, shade structure and so thinking about how do we make that whole facility safe for use? Should it be open this coming um, summer is going to be really important. Uh, James and I met with the school uh, a few months ago. I had a chat with them and their uh, principal and board about um, what the options could look like to try and say, how can we keep the pool open? Uh, how, how can the community keep the pool open? Uh, and signalling that actually council may be looking to move in this direction, but that doesn't mean the pool has to close. It might mean the council running of the pool uh, needs to um, needs to shift. Um, and they obviously choose at this pool. It's been a key part of the community for a long time, and beyond the school, it has um, wider use as well. Uh, I think to, the trajectory though is walking us towards. Um, the conversation, the hard conversation that we're having today, and I think the long-term plan is the right place to have it. So I don't think we should delay this at all. And actually, making this decision today gives clarity to staff to develop the options for the long-term plan. Uh, it doesn't commit us to any spending in the um, Darfield facility either. It just says develop the options for the long-term plan, which actually helps us all have certainty knowing what the long-term yes, plan is going to develop. Um, the, the option to spend money and confirm money will be a long-term plan decision, not a decision of a council a meeting or a committee meeting um, just like this. So I, I congratulate you bringing this together because it needs to be the same conversation. Mm -hmm. If we were to deal with them separately, we would end up like we did with Lakeside and Dunsandal, um, community facilities and Leaston still not having a facility um, and probably won't, you know, for nearly 10 years after Lakeside had one. And if we deal with all of these um, different facilities in isolation, we don't end up with the best district um, outcomes. So they do need to be had uh, together with one another. 
Um, the three years um, or two years that's in the report, I do wonder whether, uh, as Grant raised, um, have the have the conversation with uh, the Sheffield School. Uh, you know, we've got plants that could be used and given. We've got things that are on site that if we aren't going to be running the pool, they could become available. Uh, and for every year we're not running it, there's $70,000. Uh, and we could decide to have two years worth of um, sure. money given there to them uh, at seventy thousand uh, dollars for every year that they want to keep the pool open. That drops away. So if they want to run it this summer, then that seventy thousand is lost from the money we might be able to contribute to them getting an answer on the school. Uh, and that would just help generate the conversation within the community about the urgency and the needs to make the decision. Otherwise, seventy thousand dollars is real money <laughs> that's going to be spent. Uh, on an unideal location, asking kids to walk across a dangerous intersection, um, and actually some certainty for the school on a school site, on a school run facility, and a, some of our contribution to it could be there is money that at the moment we're looking to spend uh, anyway on a short term outcome, maybe we could spend it on a long term outcome. Uh, so I support the changes here, I think the LTP is the right place and let's link the two decisions and get on with it, thank you. Um, oh. Mr. Chair, sorry, uh, oh, sorry, Phil was sorry, sorry, sorry. yeah. So, sorry to Phil, just following on from Sam, um, I, I feel conflicted, um, for the reasons that uh, um, Council McGuinness has raised and supported by other, other councillors, but I feel conflicted with that, with the fact that, um, it seems like the majority of the residents of one of our towns is saying something else. Um, and I guess for that reason, speak in favour of the of the amendment it buys us the time. But I think that we need to make it really clear to to that that group through through Councillor Glidden, who's obviously the one at the sharp end of of, of all of this, and we need to support her too, by the way. Um, that you know this we need to, there, there are other options, viable options that actually can that can be real and can be better for every, better for everybody. And yeah, that's all I'll say. Thanks. Thank you. So through you, Mr. Chair, with regards to um, recommendation C and what um, Councillor Miller has brought forward, um, confirm support to progress to the long-term plan consideration, A, the future of the Sheffield pool, and B, a new sport and recreation facility in the Melvin Ward. Um, is that... Is that really necessary given that we already know that that's going to progress to the um, long-term plan or are we voting on that project to progress to the long-term plan? The two are different. One is if we say, no, we don't want to progress it to the long-term plan, then it's taken out. Or B, um, we we do, um, but it will meet the expectations of all other sports and recreation facilities that we have planned in our long term plan. So none of them are jumping the gun, um, and that's and that's what I want to clarify: whether moving accepting C as a recommendation actually um, forefronts other sports and recreation facilities that we actually do have across our district planned in our long term plan that suddenly get shunted out the way again because of this jumping the gun. And that's what I want clarification on right now, that it will be assessed alongside all the other ones that are already in our long-term plan that we have a priority to do. Okay. That's only a recommendation that it's going to long-term plan against everything else that will be in there. It's not itemising it as the only thing, so I'm happy with it as it is. You. Yep. Okay, Lydia, and I'm, I'm asking if you could be quick. I really, we're getting into second time round, so if you could, if you've got something that's different to last. And yeah, we'll, and can I get Elizabeth to go first? Yes. James, I was just wanting to ask um, how the meeting that you, Sam, and the Sheffield School had in regards to the pool and discussing their thoughts on having a pool built there in the future. I presume that you raised with them the option of donating some of the pool equipment and the potential some financing. Were they open to that option? 
Uh, so the initial conversation was more around them running the existing Sheffield Hall facility. Um, and there was some concern around that from their point of view, would, would they have to employ a caretaker and how would that look? And we didn't really get a chance to perhaps get into the contribution from council towards what that might look like or what support we could provide. Um, I think in that conversation, Sam might be able to help me out here, that there was discussion around potential donation of plant to onto the site. Um, and I, I, I don't think that's something that I actually considered before. So it was a bit of a surprise and that was, was even an option. Um, so far more additional work would need to be done on that option. Um, but it's something that is obviously from council's point of view, particularly viable. Um, that plant is in relatively good condition and has been well looked after. Sam? Yeah, thank you, Mr Chair, to support that from James. It was an initial discussion with them about trying to come up with what some of the alternatives might be. There was no commitment um, around what we would do, but to try and support them to think about an outcome that they wanted, which was to have a pool for their kids to learn to swim it, safe to access uh, and at a reasonable cost. Okay, Lydia. Um, yeah, thanks, everyone. I just, I'll reiterate about the school discussions and they need to happen with the board and the principal, and I'm happy to undertake such discussions with them um, going forward and whether that's something yeah, I need to present with them. Um, effectively, all I'm asking for is that the consultation and the operation goes to the LTP so that the community can have a say. Um, we as council are supposed to operate for the community as well and our ratepayers. Um, yeah, I, I just I just want to see the consultation go to the LTP and no decisions made here today on future operations. Thank you. Okay, uh, any more? I'd like to put that motion uh, that Lydia brought up. Those four. Yeah. All right. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Yeah. Was it? Six, six. Put your hands up again, please. One, two, three, four, five. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, all those against, it's carried. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, we'll go on to that. The next one is the Community Service and Facilities Quarter um, through report, which I'll get Denise to. So the the report is, um, is as it is written, an update on progress to date um, by the Community Services and Facilities Group and uh, the various activities. And the uh, report I tabled earlier just highlighted where we are in terms of progression with the 40-odd um, um, KPIs in that regard. Uh, so I will take it as read. Um, the report does talk about planning underway for staff to attend a meetings uh, conference as part of attracting comp Princes and business events into the into the district, and because our our guests earlier did speak a little bit about trends, um, I thought I would just use the opportunity, given that trends is happening as we speak, and it has as was happening yesterday, to just invite uh, Claire to come to the front of the room just to talk about the activity that happened underway, which is part of um, part of the trends event, and just to re reiterate the information that was sent out to councillors last week was that trends is New Zealand's largest tourism business event and the single most important event of the year on the tourism events calendar. And trends brings hundreds of international travel agents together to meet with New Zealand's leading tourism operators over four days, being the 8th to the 11th of May. It's all about building re relationships or renewing relationships and negotiating business uh, that's coming into the respective uh, territorial areas over the um, upcoming years. And it's been the first time in 14 years that trends is being held in Ōtutahi Christchurch. So Claire, if you could just explain what happened yesterday and the and the types of response that you were getting and the numbers that, that came through in the activity. Thank you. So yesterday we had a really successful first day. We saw 20 international clients. So our people, we saw people from Finland, Thailand, Canada, uh, Europe, um, Asia, 
and we have 11 minutes with those people to talk about Salwin and all of the fantastic things that we have here to offer. We also talk specifically about product, so that's about um, accommodation, activities, experiences, um, some of the, the things that we're really strong at. And we had incredible feedback. We did handpick those um, interviews because you, you know, we'll be doing it again today. The team are there today and tomorrow. So um, we'll have those appointments and we really target who we want to talk to to draw into the strengths of what someone has to offer. So we did meet with a lot of people who are working predominantly with small group bookings and FIT. So we're looking for people who um, can bring people in who have the right numbers for our accommodation and have the right numbers for our operators. So... Um, really hugely successful. Like, we were absolutely blown away at the positive comments and every single buyer that we talked to said that they were interested in follow-up and were looking to bring people in. So it was a 100% success rate. So we're really, really hitting it on the, on the head in terms of our, our target market. So we're really excited about it. And people are People were commenting about um, they didn't know all of the things that were available. They didn't know about where it was, where Salwan was, and all of the strengths of the district. And they were excited because they're always looking for new products. You know, they've been selling other parts of New Zealand for a long time. So they are really excited to be bringing people. They're always looking for a point of difference to other tour operators and inbound um, and outbound. So, yeah, it's, uh, I think we've got a very, very strong offering and the feedback was fantastic. Thank you, uh, Claire, and uh, thank you, uh, councillors, for your indulgence. I just thought, seeing as it was a topic of the day, yeah. um, that I would use the opportunity to just give you an update on what's happening as we speak. So the report is as tabled, and, and there are uh, heads of the respective teams uh, available to respond to any of the questions you might have. Okay. See you. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Chris. And just to note, too, we posted a familiar on Sunday. Uh, with people uh, hot air ballooning, jet boating, uh, visiting Middle Rock. Uh, and then in the evening we had um, Mount White Station talk about honey. Uh, there was a whole lot around farm stays uh, and those international buyers really um, keen to see uh, what Selwyn has to offer. Uh, there's a whole lot that goes on in Ashburton or used to go on in Ashburton as well. So there's people that are looking at what that um, outside of Christchurch experience looks like and they were all very... Uh, both the operators, um, complementary of what uh, you do and your team does, uh, around bringing them together and it, helping them piggyback off one another uh, and creating the culture with it that's expected. Um, and the obviously the huge interest you've just talked about from the um, guys that want to bring uh, tourists to New Zealand. So thank you for that. Nicole. <coughs> Uh, thanks for the report, uh, and it's good to hear about the trends um, conferences going going on. Um, on page forty two of the um, the book, we um, talk about that we're exploring opportunities to increase revenue in our calls and looking at um, some party packages and wedding packages how are we doing this is this something that we're getting um external suppliers to have a package that these people can just choose from or is that actually our staff who are running running those um i'll start that uh response and um jenny might have something to add at the end of it um, in terms of the uh, focus around attracting business events and conferences as well as attracting weddings, we think that's about the enhanced service offerings and product you know, that we offer as part of that package. So looking to raise the standard and, and introduce new offerings that we can provide as part of uh, what we offer to clients who are interested in using it for one or other of those things. And a lot of that will also feed into the um, a, a much more targeted marketing approach. Uh, in terms of the birthday parties, and I'll get Ginny, uh, as I said, to speak to this, I, um, my understanding is that we are mindful that there's a number of different 
uh, small businesses that run different offerings mm. that could um, make those offerings available if we can play a facilitator role in kind of pulling it together in terms of using an um, engaging with an operator who might have a candy floss making machine or that and and so that they become offerings that are presented to potential birthday party uh, recipients um, to see which which one of those offerings they like and so it's not us delivering it's working with some of our local operators to bring them in but I might be off track so Ginny is that in yeah that's great and but one of our staff, um, the girl um, in Melbourne, she uh, was our from our senior member of ex coordinators. She's working with small local businesses um, to bring that group together to see what we can offer. Um, but I think, yeah, as, as Denise said, we, we certainly tried to develop a strategy of um, uh, positioning certain holes for certain kind of activities, which are slightly far too important. Uh, some of that music community that we have new. Uh, strategic leads and sponsorship manager, and we just going to get a bit of the business plan at the moment. So, um, yeah, really trying to see how we sell a quite a unique menu or board. Um, and uh, yeah, you've seen strategy, pretty good and strategy, and we'll try to do best research. But, um, no, that's, that's good to hear that we're um, trying to activate the spaces. Yeah. I mean, they, they are there to be be used and if they're sitting empty mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a bit of a worry for us as well uh it was also good to see the uh report about the youth friendly spaces audit report about trrta and i'm just interested to know so what happens with this now the report again i'll get nikki <laughs> to uh, to follow that up as a relevant head of but i think um we would delighted that there was um, a lot of positives that came yes. out of that Okay. And there was some very useful work on, but Nikki, you might want to uh, talk about that in particular. Thank you, Denise. Um, Hayley and Matt and I have discussed this report, and some of the recommendations are already underway, and some are really simple to implement. Yesterday, we decided that the water tap in the downstairs room and the in the workshop area could be accessible. So we don't need to go to the expense of bringing in a water cooler. We just need to make that available to the young people. Okay. It was something that we hadn't thought about. So that was great. Um, we're already working on some really good after school and weekend support of our young people. And that is going really well at the moment. I'm thrilled with how that's working out. And we are working with the young people and our support crew to engage them in more of the resources that we have as part of our programming fleet. So I think if you call in on a weekend or if, if young people do, there'll be more and more for them to actually do in quite guided and structured activities. I know that's, that's good, thank you. And um, <clears throat> I also wanted to make a commendation to our staff because the youth were all through the report. They've said that they are very friendly and welcoming, and that's really great. Mm. Great to hear. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Phil, cool. uh, thank you for the report. Um, some uh, really amazing stuff that your team's doing, and it's uh, something that we should be proud of as a community, as a council. Um, I raised it at the light when we had this report last time, and I raised it again around the. Um, forming arts community. Um, they're not represented yeah. in the report. We, we're obviously struggling still to find the narrative of how of how we do that. Um, we need to, they're, they're, they're a huge community. I mean, we're talking about um, yeah, the kid that learns to pick up a violin for the first time right through to the person who moves through the CSO or the, the Philharmonic Orchestra somewhere in, in the world. The formers, yeah, it is a massive community that is um, that we need to be looking at. We represent sport and recreation and heritage and culture and, and libraries, and it's all really put in here. So I guess, again, it's something I think we're missing a visual on. And um, clearly it's a passion of mine. Happy to help with the narrative if I can. If it is a uh, well of Council in terms of progressing towards some sort of an art strategic plan, uh, which is, I, I would 
suggests would need to be broader than performing arts, but would definitely incorporate that, then that's something that 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 we could consider putting into the work plan over the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah. Oh, I think, Denise, that's absolutely correct. But I think that the arts plan, uh, if, it's, if the performing arts is just part of an arts plan, then it, it, it diminishes how big it actually is. Because in the past, this council has considered the performing arts as just being part of the arts or youth and, and, and culture plan. But I mean, I can go through the, 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 the sheer magnitude of the people within our community that are involved in the performing arts, not the visual arts, not the artistic arts, but the performing arts. So I think that it is something that actually warrants a specific narrative that we have. Now, I'm not saying that it needs to be a plan, but we need to work out where it fits in our other plans as a specific standalone item. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you very much for the report, Claire, for your presentation. I, I think I'd just acknowledge on page 42 that Boston Community Centre alongside the Selwyn Integrated Youth Hub has begun to work on comedy evening to showcase facility as a performing arts space and uh, also local performing arts. Um, so great work on that and just your comment there, uh, Councillor Dean. I've got a number of questions and just first of all, just um, uh, commend the staff and yourself, Denise, on what you're currently doing. The performance numbers are really good in terms of activating the space. The, the numbers here show that it's um, <coughs> doing. you are doing a fantastic job. Um, whilst new space. Uh, I'll just start with a bit of community feedback actually and it was a, a couple of instances where I've been contacted by uh, community committees and one of them was the Dunsandle Community Committee where they had trouble um, booking the space uh, uh, a little while ago for funerals and there was some things, there was some, um, I guess, hurt over that, over the way it was perhaps dealt with and I know you're dealing with that but I just wanted to um, speak on behalf of the community there to say that was what was already a, a hard time of grieving uh, was made particularly more difficult through the, uh, the booking process. Uh, and then also some feedback from the, the day club and I, I um, through the contestable fund, I just wanted to ensure that communication to the groups around the terms of that particular funding is well communicated because uh, according to uh, maybe some of the members that have contacted me, they, they wanted to know why I had finished and I believe it's the communication around the terms of which it, they can receive the funding. Um, Halls, uh, that was, thank you very much, Councillor uh, Reid, uh, your comment there. I think we've got a fantastic asset in our in our halls and all we can do to showcase those beautiful historic halls uh, will do us not only good economically, but from a tourism aspect as well. Uh, so thank you, um, Jenny. Um, we refer to a bit later on the report that all of the, the community halls um, and I just noticed that a couple of them are missing, like the little require huts and perhaps need just some explanation around that, whether they are in a different portfolio. Um, and if it's possible, because I know it's been asked before around the location, if there's a, uh, a map that shows where all of our halls are in the vicinity to their closest big hall, um, as we look sort of to rationalise this, the assets. Um, a question around operational uh, security and risks, and perhaps it falls into the, the audit and risk um, uh, committee, but I just wanted some sort of report around current behaviours, perhaps at Taratia, uh, increased perhaps escalation of risk and how staff are dealing with those and, and um, how can they, what can they exercise under their current delegations, can they issue trespass notices to those that aren't a desirable activity. And just around the trends, I commend staff on that as well. But I just wonder what sort of economic uh, forecast we measure that out with when we're putting efforts into doing that. Can we expect a million to two million dollar return on perhaps some of the attractions that we, the people that we bring? It's a lot of it, I realise. But... Thank you. So just in response to that, in terms of um, uh, some of the initiatives that we've got underway in terms of dealing with, uh, uh, I guess, poor behaviour, um, would you like us to bring that back as the, ne the next quarterly report to give a bit more of a breakdown of exactly what we're doing and the sorts of results that we're seeing? Um, would that be helpful in terms of building a picture of our, our approach? Perhaps, um, maybe uh, through you, Mr. The CEO, just um, in terms of how staff are protected and what the delegations are, and also the the um, perhaps the culture of our district as well and what's what's that telling us in terms of that and are staff safe 
is the layout of the the, um, the building safe for our staff to operate with it? And again, whether that sits on a different committee, that's uh, up to that, but it'd be good okay. to, well, to just, understand that. I, from I guess from, um, I'll, I'll obviously defer to David if he wants to say something. I guess in terms of what we are looking at is a, a number of collaborative relationships with um, with community organisations that are accredited with Oranga Tamariki um, to, and, and have, have expertise in dealing with young people who face additional risks. And we are, um, in, uh, in, in, we have entered into some collaborative arrangements where they will have, you know, they're going to have greater visibility within our, within both our uh, internal facilities as well as our, uh, as well as the outside, mm -hmm. um, in terms of the town centre. It's just part of the positive role modelling of of adults, encouraging adults to participate and and encourage and for adults to also uh, value the participation of young people. So that's some work that we're doing. Um, Nikki might want to add a few words, but I, I might, it might be useful for you to understand a little bit better about the, the model that we're delivering sure. in, the future, in a future report. So I'm not sure if David, if you wanted to say something or, or we go to Nikki. Other than uh, for you, Mr. Chair, to, to Shane, um, safety of our staff and safety of our facility users is something that we regularly address at executive team meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Elizabeth. Oh, sorry, Nikki. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to confirm what David has just said. We're actively involved in supporting the staff and making sure they're safe at work. So I feel very comfortable about what we're doing um, with the team. Thank you. Okay. Right, my turn is it. Um, I just wanted to raise this. I've probably talked about it before, but I'd like to bring it up again. Local bookings of the halls. Instead of the lengthy um, applying for funding process that we're currently using, can we not look at having a community funding rate where no one potentially registered with the council, our community groups and ratepayers can have reduced higher costs for their local halls? I'd like to see the quantity of use, not just the financial gain from um, occasional hall hire. Uh, this is done in Australia where I lived, where there were special uh, admission rates on proof of address for ratepayers. One overall theme that I'm hearing from our underused halls is the cost to the communities. Uh, surely rates already accommodate their investment. Um, if I res uh, I'll respond to that, in, sorry, I'll respond to that, um, Councillor Munt, as well as the question that um, didn't get answered that Councillor EPHA raised around facilities. There is a community rate for hall hires. So we've already um, addressed that. So there's quite a distinction between a corporate rate for a, a booking and a community rate. Um, I guess what um, what we're also recognising is that, um, that as part of the community grants fund, uh, we, we want to encourage community groups to do community-led activities and that there are potentially a range of costs that um, our community groups face in, in doing so. One of those might be the facility hire, but there may be a number of other costs um, or, or alternative costs because there may not be a cost to the, um, the location that they choose. And so the Community Grants Fund was set up um, to do that, and we have, for those that are simply wanting a contribution towards the all hire, we have streamlined that process so that it's a much, uh, there's very uh, very few questions that actually need to get answered, and it's primarily a bit of a kind of a tick box um, process. But we also recognise that for some community groups, it's not, it's not about the all hire cost, it's actually other costs. And um, and also having a contestable process means that that um, that the council the council or panel can consider the merits and they can also consider the needs of particular communities when they prioritise where the funding is 
where the funding is made. Um, you do raise a point around volume of hires, um, something about counting the number of bookings in which they are. We certainly capture that information and perhaps in the next report we could we could um, focus on that so that you get a real sense of which ones for which facility there were a lot of you know how many community hires, how many were council initiated uh, activity hires and how many were corporate hires. Then we can definitely do that. We we do capture that information. Uh, just in terms of Councillor Epihar's question, which is around not all uh, uh, centres and halls are captured there, that is correct. So over the um, past three years, as, uh, uh, as um, we have moved to increase Council's operational responsibility uh, in regards to uh, community centres and halls, community services and facilities has been allocated those facilities that were deemed suitable by council staff for public hire and so that has been the basis on which um the, the current you know the the reason why we've currently got 23 is that they were deemed to be suitable for public hire there are a couple of facilities which are managed differently and and one example of that would be um where it's in part of a camping ground and in effect it also needs to be available on a more uh, informal basis for campers and um and so that's that to date has been being managed um out of a different part of council and similarly there's another facility which has an exclusive uh individual hire with one with one provider so therefore it's not available for public hire um, so that is, I guess, an explanation of why we are in this in the position we are. So, so the twenty three that uh, that community services and facilities operation manage is not the exhaustive number of all of the facilities. Mm. Um, internally, as as we've um, moved through the organisational restructure, we've signalled an opportunity to talk further about that, um, and also the fact that we're currently working on both a play. Uh, active recreation and sports strategy and a wellbeing strategy may also uh, pro provide us with an opportunity to uh, direct um, some of those uh, potentially underutilised facilities to to into that more of an exclusive use or exclusive kind of sector based use um, for some of those facilities. So that's the situation, and it is actively under review at the moment. But that is why we're in the situation that we are. Okay. Can I have a move on to second up uh, Denise's report, please? Sam and um, Deborah, thank you. All those in favour, against um, carried. Okay. Okay. Okay, then we're going to to, uh, to our Maori names and bilingual signage. If we get Nicola to come forward, please. I'll push the right button. Oh, sorry. While they're doing that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the report. Right. While they're doing that, I'd like to move the report. Yeah, I can. Well, for a community service one, or this one. Okay. Yep. okay. And Sam seconder. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so you have the report in front of you, which uh, I'll take as um, read, but there is a section in the report that uh, continues to generate some discussion, um, and it's around the addition of the word library to Te Ara Aotea. So um, I'd like to talk to the rationale for the proposal that is included in the report. So that's a proposal for internationally recognised symbols and digital signage for the functions of this important uh, multi-use facility. 
Um, the report lists the multiple functions that Tiara Atia includes, including uh, function the library. So those are um, creative arts, crafts and learning spaces, meeting spaces, performing arts spaces, places for people to study and work, uh, cafe and lounge area for relaxing, heritage displays, public art displays, play spaces and equipment for children, digital equipment, computers and Wi-Fi for public use. And um, it also includes the outdoor sensory and community gardens and gathering places, including uh, the recently installed Kai Table. The name um, Tiara Antia is for a building which is an identity, and the name is informed by the cultural narrative and speaks to the facility's purpose um, as an unobstructed trail to the world and beyond. So I've asked uh, Mickey and Marine, he does uh, arts, culture, and lifelong learning, to explain the signage and to speak to the rationale in relation to access, wayfinding principles, and universal signage. And the reason I've asked Mickey to do that is she was involved in uh, the design of Tiara Antia and has a much greater understanding of those discussions and their input at that particular time. Thank you, Nicola. Um, can you just pop that onto the main slide, uh, the, just the first slide rather than... It is the first slide. Yeah, but a different view down there. It's the single PowerPoint view. Oh, yeah, let me just go to that. Sorry about yeah. that. Sorry. Um, I'd like to take you back to the design project when we were working with the architects with the project team and with Workshop E, and we noted that wayfinding within Tiara Atia would be simple and intuitive for all visitors. It would make best use of key sight lines and will be considerative of visitor circulation. Messaging will be succinct and the tone of the language will be warm and inviting. It will accommodate a range of literacy. No. It will accommodate a range of literacy capabilities, visual needs, and mobility requirements. A combination of symbols, words, and colorways will be used. All written signage will be bilingual with Te Reo Māori from left to right and top to bottom. Symbols, symbols are accessible to all of us as we travel through airports and in shopping malls, we're familiar with those common symbols. And as part of the project, we started to design some additional symbols. Could you move to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, that I am suggesting that we continue to build on. So it will be easy to show library and library books. It will be easy to show computers and show children being read a story. And you can see in these early symbols, we started to develop icons for meeting rooms, for the maker spaces, the workshops, computers. Um, and so that is that I wanted to show you that is work that we had already started doing several years ago. Um, access is really important, and I learned years ago in library design that for some people, entering a public building is a frightening experience. So good design principle says, let's keep access open and clear and uncluttered. And I always like to have a counter or a piece of furniture that I can look at from outside and I can see and I can make my way to it. And that's exactly what that counter in Tiara Ati with the train is for. That's your first safe landing point. So um, for that reason, the doors are clear at Tiara Ati, those central doors, so people feel safe. Those central doors also are clear so our staff feel safe so they can look outside and know what's happening outside and who's coming into the building. Um, I'd like to see that we continue to work in the spirit of accessibility, making 
all of our signs really easy for everyone, regardless of their ability and their age to read. This is the message that White House School gave us in the early planning project as well. Use visual symbols as much as you can, please. Thank you. Uh, so there's one more slide because I had been asked a question about what digital signage might look like. We have space within Tiara Atea and also our love other libraries to uh, install quite large visual signs. Um, these will be these will tell you what's happening inside on a day. Might be a preschool story time or a baby session, or it could be a book club or it could be a coding club, or the IRD might be there at three o'clock, or the Justice of the Peace at two. And the library staff, the team, the arts, culture, and life from can change up that content very easily. And we can promote our resources and other information about arts, culture, and lifelong learning activities on those signs. These are just some examples that Oscar collected up for us today. Thank you, Samantha. Thank, thank you. Uh, questions? Deborah? Um, thank you. And thank you for the report. Um, the, what you've just put up with regards to the international signage, that was not appended to our report. This is separate. Thank you. Um, it just helps clarify one of the issues that I wanted to bring up with regards to um, having a bilingual language um, and how important it is, especially when you're traveling overseas, um, Middle Eastern countries, you were so relieved when you actually see um, a sign and then underneath it actually does have English or French or another um, language that is recognized um, for visitors to actually um, know where the orientation is, is, is at. Um, and I noted with Kakaha Park, um, we called it a park still, so it still comes under a reserve. So when someone's talking about a park, they know where the park is. Um, and I think, I think that's very helpful um, for those of us who are still learning Te Kanga Māori um, and where um, this cultural by by diversity actually sits um, within our, our language structure. And I do recognise that it is, Maori is an official language of New Zealand. Um, but just to add through to that, um, there was a comment about where names are gifted. Um, and I know that um, many runanga are asked, you know, by organisations to gift a name. Um, what would be really helpful and educational is where a name has been gifted. Um, and I'll use one for example, it's at Springston School and it's Springston and it's Makanui. Um, it would be really good to understand if we are going to use bilingual um, um, language um, and it has been gifted to a community, some understanding to that community of why it was gifted. I understand there will be a story but it's important that the community know the narrative of that particular story. Um, we all accept that we all have many Maori names like Timaru, um, for example, Omaru. We know that they are places, they are destinations. Um, I think to help us all along this journey, we need to be probably a bit more explicit in, in understanding the cultural background. And I'm so pleased that you have added the word library regards to Tiara Atia um, as known as a destination um, and with the international signs, then you can find out what that des destination actually incorporates. But um, So I just want to add further onto the work that you may need to do with regards to, um, let's call it educating Tikanga Maori within our community. And that would be helpful. Thank you. Elizabeth. Hi, thank you for this 
lovely work, Oscar, if you're still here. This is really good, and I think this will be fantastic, having the digital signage and really helpful. Um, I just wasn't really clear on, I mean, this is titled, um, you know, basically here we're looking at having a, oops, sorry, um, bilingual, um, well, sorry, where are we? Yeah, um, basically having a plan for bilingual strategic action plan going forward, but I wasn't really clear on what the bilingual strategic action plan actually is because it's not really clear to me going forward um, and really succinct and what that's going to look like and encompass. So I think the community would probably like to see something come out of that today, which really states to us, if a name is gifted, how is it appropriate to have some English, which well, doesn't have to be a translation, obviously, because obviously as we know that's not that's not necessarily fitting, but something that just gives a little bit of homage to what the building's intent and purposes are. Um, if you can explain that, it'd be really helpful. Thank you. Sorry, Elizabeth, I don't understand what your question is. Um, so my question is, we're talking about having a, a bicultural strategic action plan going forward for any naming of buildings. It just wasn't, it wasn't succinct um, and it didn't fully understand what that action plan actually is and how that's... Right. Coined thank for us. You. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so the bicultural, the, um, the the bicultural strategic action plan is not um, about naming. It is an um, action plan that is aimed at um, uh, expressing the council's uh, aspirations around uh, developing its capability to. Uh, within a bicultural space and, and to deliver on its commitments and its aspirations around that. Um, but what uh, is noted is that uh, within the pieces of work that would be included within that plan, which is still being developed, so um, that, that will come to council at a later stage, but within that is the development of a Te Reo Māori policy uh, for naming, which would include uh, bi bilingual um, naming, dual naming, um, and Te Reo Māori naming, and the principles around that and the guidance that would be used to ensure that there was consistency and uh, the expectation is, is that we would work on the development of that policy Policy with input from one finger uh, around the tikanga and processes and what would be appropriate. So the bicultural strategic action plan is different uh, from the, the naming policy that you're talking about. Um, so the strategic action plan is for council around developing capability. So I can just space. add to that um, in term a uh, council mm -hmm. around the um, that was included. What was included in the report was. For your information, some of the some of the uh, actions that are currently underway in terms of bilingual signage, and that we expect to, and what what some of that activity is that we're expecting to continue. So the the um, some of that uh, what's happening in the new builds. It also is intended to um, uh, provide for your information that we are intending to pull it together, as Nicholas said. In a bicultural, um, a bilingual, sorry, po policy, that we think there's benefit in drawing in all the different bits of, of work that are happening in, across council um, that touch on this bi um, bilingual signage and have it in one, uh, catch it in re or re referenced from one one policy so that we ensure alignment. So it's, I guess, a bigger picture. Without, but also letting you know the the what the activity that's underway. Um, is that does that answer your question? Uh, yes and no. It just feels like it's been quite a long time for um, the community to have some feedback on uh, what could be a really simple solution that was brought to us, um, obviously by the Wollaston Residents Group, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and some solutions were found then. I just thought that that would have been something that wouldn't have taken too long to draw up. Uh, I guess the, we're telling you from an operational perspective what we intend to do, and that was what Nikki was talking about. So it was our intention with the report and to tell you what we're doing about signage. One was that we are intending um, and putting further universal signage up so that it's really clear what the functions are that um, that are uh, available within the building 
and we are uh, telling you within that report that we're also um, currently developing up some digital signage that will also ensure that people that are passing by um, know what's happening in that building. So that is the operational response to the, this committee in terms of the actions we, we are taking for your information. So can I just clarify then this is external signage, not internal? Yes, the intention is it is external and it could also be internal. Sophie? Hello, ladies, thank you very much. Everybody has been part of this. It, yeah, it's it's an interesting wee topic. Um, I guess, so for instance, Deborah mentioned Kakaha Park and as the fact that it includes Park. Park has a multitude of meanings. You can do a lot of different things in a park. A library is very specifically book oriented. Um, and that is not what Tiara Atia is. Um, in fact, if we were going to have bilingual signage that included the word library, it would have to say something like Te Whare Puka Puka or Te Whare Kakaho, which arguably is longer and more confusing than Te Ara Atia. Um, there is information around the background, the narrative to the name available online, and it's in the building as well. Um, perhaps if people haven't seen it, there might be worth including something in a plainer font. The Ponamu panels by the entrances are beautiful and everything, but if people don't realize that it's worth stopping, I don't, I don't know. In terms of visually, perhaps some people haven't seen it. Um, and in terms of overseas signage, um, it's, it's interesting. I've, in, during the course of this quite long discussion, we've heard that it must be very confusing for non-English speaking immigrants. Um, I haven't actually heard from any. Uh, who have told me that this is confusing. I honestly don't necessarily feel that that is true, but I would love to hear from any who do find it confusing. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> quite honestly, if you're a non-English or somebody who was not raised with English as one of your primary languages, um, you've normally got two or three languages already. Picking up a few other words is not always the biggest deal on the planet. Um, and we do live in quite an Anglo-centric world. Uh, it's it's easy to think that this is the only language of relevance. It's not. Um, all right, so in terms of the symbols, I do agree they will help people find their way around. That's great. Um, I just wanted to ask though, so within Te Ara Atia at the moment, the, the arrow boards, as my kids call them, um, they've, they quite often, they have the symbol, then they have, um, English and Te Reo Māori right next to them. So is that, in terms of any changes to the signage within the building or on the outside, is that expected to be there as well as the symbol? Um, just thinking that, just because that's that's what I see on the inside already, that there are words and symbols paired together. Um, yeah, and if so, whereabouts would we expect to see that? Thank you. Our plan was not to change the signage inside. Our plan was to add the symbols outside to the door to be able to explain what's inside, better explain what is inside. Sam? Yeah, I remember he and I took a for the partnership um, through this work. I think this, this paper that's in front of us is about bilingual signage uh, and we can focus on one part of that and that's been brought to us and it's appropriate that this report addresses uh, Te Ara Atia. Um, but this is a step uh, in raising bilingual awareness uh, as we grow and mature as a country, <laughs> remembering that for many years uh, Te Reo Māori was the only thing spoken in Aotearoa uh, through law changes, uh, it was criminalised to use the language. People were punished, children were punished for speaking to Reo, and it became uh, a really unusual thing to have to Reo used in the country of its, its home. Uh, and so as we try and redress some of that, uh, 
and grow that again, of course that brings challenge and that is difficult because change is always um, can, or can be un uncomfortable. Um, but I think to be true to wanting to heal and mature and grow, this paper brings um, a sense of comfort to me that we're wanting to walk in a direction of partnership uh, and help people uh, on that on that learning trajectory. Um, uh, o te mohi o tanga o te tātou hapuri, me tō tātou reo, uh, me te tātou tikanga. Kona ho tata he wahi matoranga, uh, kona poaka he painga nui ki tene. Uh, and if I had asked myself what that meant um, without doing some research, I would have had very little idea. I want to challenge myself to learn and grow in my language skills and understanding to know my journey in that is um, certainly still at the beginning phases. But if, if I don't try and use the language, uh, then I'm not going to grow myself. And so being challenged with that, what I said, uh, I'm excited by this work to add new depth and understanding to our community uh, about our culture uh, and our language. Our facilities are places to learn and signage is a key part of of helping us learn. Uh, so thank you for the report that sits here. I think that um, whether or not the symbols address some of our community's concern, um, we'll know more when the symbols are there uh, because what size are they, where are they located, uh, how often do I see them, are they visible from a car as I drive past, do I have to be up against the building? Like Those are all the things that people, um, I think the feedback is, they, 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 need, they want that clarity around where that's at. So this, to me, the Tiara Atia piece is, this isn't a discussion about the name of the building, this is about signage. Uh, and so where is the appropriate place to put signage that's clear for people to understand what's held inside um, our beautiful Tiara Atia. Thank you. Grant? Yeah, I just um, had some time, so I just Googled Ralston Library and the first thing that came up was Tiara Atia. So it's, it's not unclear where it is, and my perception is that everyone knows where it is. Um, we'll continue to always refer to it as Tiara Atia, and I think the name is well embedded in the community. So um, I don't see it's really a problem. I don't think see anyone arguing with the idea of bilingual signage. But I'm, I'm, I'm still sitting here sort of trying to understand. We seem to be making a mountain out of a molehill, really. I'm, it's not quite sure what we have this debate about, but... You know, I went to the library this morning, I had a look, there's a library return slot on, it says clearly library returns on where you put your books back. Um, you know, by adding a small library word, I don't think it's my view of the world, is it, it doesn't diminish the manner of the name at all by having additional signage. I'm, I'm just sort of saying, why wouldn't we put a small sign saying library on if that's what the community wants? But I think the vast, vast majority of people will continue to refer to it as TRRT and the, and the narrative that goes with it. but. Let's, let's not make something that's very um, tie ourselves in knots, which seems to be a relatively inconsequential. I just, I still haven't had the why. If you're going to put a symbol off of a book, why not just put a word saying library underneath it? I just, it doesn't seem to be a massive, massive impost on the manner of the building or the name. So, um, but that's my opinion. I'm not. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sam, for those words. That was awesome. I think that really sum, summed it up for my thinking too. I wasn't going to talk about this because it's um, we're talking about bilingual signage, but we seem to have made this whole conversation about Te Ara Atea and the Ralston Residents Community uh, uh, Residents Association, thank you, <laughs> uh, drive to have the word library on the video. I did a bit, a bit more in, in investigation uh, with the community and because being the position where I spend a lot of my days at the cafe down down the road. Um, and the range, it is, it is a 50-50 issue. It is by mere definition a loose, loose. Uh, we put it on, we don't put it on. People's um, views range from removing the word Seattle Atia, replacing it with the, with the word library, to leaving it as it is entirely. Those people who wanted the to um, uh, most people said in, in, in the middle somewhere, um, those favouring the word library 
it wasn't about um, wayfinding. Way it was about having the word pro prominently placed on the side of, of, of the wall. I, I, I say this, I didn't add to their narrative. I was simply there, there, there listening. But it was always followed up with things that this council does not represent when it comes to language and our biculturalism and our partnership with mana whenua. Um, I think that the wayfinding signs, I think Grant's right, I think the wayfinding signs aren't, aren't going to appease the community. The, the word library on a wayfinding sign would be probably a better way to do it than just an international symbol. However, um, we're not going to know until, until the symbol's up, to, uh, up to there. Um, yep. uh, I speak in favour of not having the word library put on the side of, 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 of the building, but I speak in favour of having some wayfinding signs with the word library on, the, on that wayfinding sign. And uh, as Grant says, this is a storm and teacup. The, the company we've got to, to, to this point, a wayfinding sign out the front of all the facilities that are out there. there. And let's face it, they are immense, as you, as you pointed out, Nikki, um, would be a good way to go forward. Thank you. Nicole? Uh, I, I agree with what's been said by Councillor McInnes um, and Councillor Dean and um, Councillor Miller. I mean, Tiaratia is the name of this building. It does not translate to the many uses that are, it, it encompasses the many uses of that building. It doesn't translate to library. Mm. Um, just looking at, at the functions, I mean, how many bullet points are we at? Two, there's about two, four, it's about 11 bullet points of what the building encompasses. It, it's not just a library. Library is only really one thing of those bullet points. And um, and as Grant said, there's people aren't struggling to find the building. It is quite obviously a council civic building on the main street of Rolleston. It is the one, the biggest building there. And as Nikki has said, you who quite clearly can see into the building from the street as well. Um, but there may be sectors who think that it needs more of an explanation. And I, I mean, I, I think maybe we can have this wayfinding and have on something on the door. Um, and it's good to see the international signs as um, and whether it need something written as, as well. I mean that that needs to be looked looked at, but definitely not um, something in bold above where the actual on the building next to TRT because that is not what it is that building is called. It's not a library. Mm -hmm. It just it's got library books in it, but it's so much more than just a library. Really shame. Dear Mr. Chair, Tenakwe, Kosari Tunai Tenakwe, Ete Teratia Tenakwe, Ete Nai Terui Hiki Hiki, and Nai Tua Huridi, and Mana Fenoa Tenakwe. I've been sitting there, I've been listening, and also want to acknowledge you and um, the community that have uh, brought this discussion to the to the table and to councillors because it's a, a rational uh, um, conversation that needs to be had had early and then agreed to. So it's it's something that shouldn't cause a fence, but actually should bring us together closer as a district, a nation, of cultures. To our Māori actually allows other ethnicities, other cultures a window into where they feel safe in a place, in their space, and uh, are protected and cared for, in my opinion. That's what Te Ao Māori does for multi-cultures throughout our uh, Aotearoa, throughout our district. So that's an opportunity for us to work together for that. The original agreement, whatever it was, needs to stand to not cause offence. Uh, however, um, in the report agreed to wayfinding as it fits in and ties to the cultural narrative. I mean, that's translated digitally. So everyone's going to look for Google and as Grant's already said, 
you know, and from an international perspective, we're bringing people to here to experience our mana whenua, our culture, our collaborative approach to uh, within the law, tanga titiriti, uh, titiriti centric, um, and offer that multicultural lens. We've talked about the official three languages, and if you search it, it comes up first with Māori, a sign, and an English. And the physical embodiment of the contributors to this study, uh, unobstructed pathway to knowledge, to sacredness, we're also acknowledging our tūpuna, uh, mama whenua tūpuna, Kat Brown, our um, kaifakairo um, uh, pirikawi, heke tuna. You know, these are very sacred, it's a very sacred space, a very sacred place, and an opportunity for us to recognise it, to grow together, and share that knowledge, that basket of, of knowledge. So, look, uh, to you in, in Grant's camp where we've, we're uh, debating on something that it needs that, that uh, is relevant, obviously, but this paper refers to uh, bilingual signage uh, and needs to continue with our towns the whole lot, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Would someone like to move this re uh, report be received? Shane. Sorry, 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 you did too. All those in favour? Aye. Uh, thanks. Carried. Thank you. Uh, closing karakia, please, Sam. Una here, una here. Tapo, tapo. Kia watia, kia watia. Ai, kua watia. Kura hop. All right, close. Thank you for your attendance. Morning, sir.